The market is well ahead of the Fed. This is clearly what's propelled a lot of the small cap optimism. These are the other groups that are going to benefit from interest rates starting to move lower again. And investors are going to see there's going to be an opportunity there. The Fed does not have to deliver those cuts. It just has to get the market thinking, hey, the Fed's moving that direction. It's not just inflation that's driving cuts now. It's the broader economy that the Fed is watching. That cash on the sideline that gets put to work in a world where all of these uncertainties of rates, inflation, and recession start to shrink. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Do you remember when the summer used to be boring? Remember that? There's nothing boring about this. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market on the S&P 500. Firmer here by a tenth of 1%. Coming off the back of the biggest one-day loss since April on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, the worst day since December 2022. There's nothing boring about this morning. Here's your day ahead. 8.15 Eastern Time. We get a rate decision from the ECB. 15 minutes after that. Jobless claims. 15 minutes after that, a news conference with President Lagarde. And then a little bit later this afternoon from the RNC in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Donald Trump, the former president, addressing the Republican convention. With me around a table, I get lucky this morning, Jay Piloski of TPW. Jay, remember when summer was boring? Wasn't that great? There is nothing boring about this right now, is there? No, not at all, John. It's been really a, a crazy market just in the last couple of days, going back the last couple of months. I mean, when you talk about just as the crescendo about a narrow market and bad breath reaches its peak, right? Boom. Massive reversal. Huge move in small caps that we can talk about throughout this morning. Need to talk about the politics as well, Jay, so let's get into it. The former president addressing the Republican convention a little bit later. We need to talk about the pressure building on Joe Biden. The dam is breaking big time. And I'll go through just some of the reports we've had. Not in the last 24 hours, in the last 12 hours. This from ABC News, reporting that both Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader of the House, Akeem Jeffries, have indicated to the President it's time to step aside. CNN reporting that former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has basically told President Biden the same thing in private conversations. Semaphore yesterday afternoon as well, Jay, reporting that the campaign funding is essentially drying up. Has the pressure ever been greater on this President? Yeah, it's interesting, right, John? Because I think Joe Biden is a fighter. And uh, this is all making him dig in, seems to be the case uh, so far. And what's really surprising to me is you have this massive push. Uh, but on the other side of it, you have things like 538 in their polling on the Electoral College, which suggests Joe Biden today, if the election was held today, Joe Biden wouldn't win with 277 electoral votes versus 263 for former President uh, Trump. And yet that seems to get lost in the perspective. The other thing that I think is really powerful, and I know we're going to talk about it over the course of the hour here, is that the, the economic policy mix between the two candidates is night and day. And one of them is very constructive for the United States, as I believe, and the other is very destructive from an economic point of view. Would you like to tell us which one's destructive and which one's constructive? Uh, well, it's not just me, right? I mean, if you look at Goldman Sachs, if you look at Moody's, if you look at the Peterson Institute, if you look at 16 Nobel laureates, all have come out and said that Donald Trump's plan is uh, bad for the United States. It means uh, lower growth. It means higher inflation, right? You have mass deportations. That throws a wrench into the labor market. You have tariff uh, hikes. You have uh, extension of fiscal uh, of tax cuts. You have essentially fiscal incontinence. And I think it sets up the real risk of a dollar crash, which uh, sets the stage for a reversal of what has been a 15 year run of massive U.S. financial asset outperformance. A dollar weakness appears to be the objective of the incoming administration if they win. Are you saying that U.S. exceptionalism, dollar dominance, is going to be questioned come November if Donald Trump wins? Absolutely. That's, I think that's the case. And you're already starting to see it a little bit right now. It hasn't really manifested because I think notwithstanding the, the kind of the frenzy around Joe Biden, the polling is not at all a suggestive of the same, right? Polling is extremely tight within the margin of error across the swing states as well as nationally. And so that's why I think the market hasn't quite moved in this. But it really does set the stage for things like, okay, does this small cap rally have legs? 
does this broadening out of the equity market, is it sustainable? Or do we run kind of hard into the fall and then get smacked in the face with uh, a, a Trump victory that leads people to question the policy mix of the United States and the Fed gets put in a box, right? Because the Fed is going to be cutting. I think yep. that's pretty clear. But if we get this situation, this worry, the dollar starts to fall, the Fed has to raise rates, the dollar continues to fall, rates have to go higher. And look, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a bond market that has not broken out. Equities have clearly broken out. And by the way, it's global, right? It's not narrow. It's not the Magnificent Seven. Acqui, all country world, all time highs. IFA, all time highs. Acqui X US, two year highs. Emerging market two-year highs, okay? So we're, we're in a situation where the other countries are starting to do reasonably well. And here we call into question the policy mix of the United States in a massively over-owned asset, right? Everybody is overweight U.S. equities. Everybody is overweight U.S. treasuries, okay? So you have things like the yen. Fair value is considered to be 100. It's now at 156. You look at the euro. Fair value is considered 120. It's at 109. You look at emerging market currencies, absolutely bludgeoned. So I think there's, uh, it's not yet percolated in the minds of folks, but we got to be careful what we wish for. If we wish for a weaker dollar and we get a weaker dollar, then I think that suggests that the U.S. is not going to be the place to be uh, for the next several years. We've got a stronger dollar on the screen this morning. We're firm about a tenth of 1% on the dollar index. We've got a lot to talk about this morning too. Through the hour with Jay Pulaski, your record market on the S&P 500, just a touch firmer, trying to crawl back in Shinkai by just two points on the S&P, up by 0.05%. In the bond market, yields creeping higher, back towards 4.20, 4.18.27. We can talk a lot about foreign exchange, the euro a little weaker, going into that ECB decision a little bit later, euro dollar at 109.30. Coming up this hour, Anne-Marie joining us as Democratic leadership pushes Biden to step aside. Sheila Kaolu of Jefferies as deep discounting hits the airlines and Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen looking for a super September for global rate cuts. We begin with our top story, Biden can't catch a break. Just as illness forces the president to leave the campaign trail, the dam breaks. ABC News reporting both Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries have indicated to President Biden it might be best to step aside. Amory joins us now from the RNC in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Amory, before we get to the events of where you are, we need to talk about what's happening elsewhere. How great is the pressure on President Biden to make a move? It's intensifying, that's for sure. Over the past 24 hours, he had a really rough 24 hours, not to mention that uh, the White House came out and said he tested positive for COVID-19. It is not just Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer going to Rehoboth Beach over the weekend telling him, we think you need to step aside, or the fact that Hakeem Jeffries as well, the House Minority Leader saying to the president, if you stay in this race, this is going to hurt down ballot. This might mean we can lose the House. But then you have former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, according According to CNN, according to Politico, also having a direct conversation with the president saying, look, your polling shows that this is going to be uh, a loss against former President Donald Trump, and you are going to really uh, ruin the ticket for House members. So these are three top Democrats. Now, they're not saying this publicly, although if you read their statements of denials, these are not exactly straightforward denials to the press that these conversations took place. But what you are seeing is top three Democrats, especially Speaker Pelosi, who's very close to the president, telling him directly, face to face, that we think you need to step aside. Now, the president is now isolating. He's back in Delaware. And I think the next few days, we should note who he is meeting with. Is there going to be a family powwow? And could this potentially, could he heed these calls and step aside? At the moment, though, it does sound like he is defiant. When you ask the White House what is going on, they say, this is his race. He's sticking with it. He has the delegates. And he will be on the ticket November 5th. Yeah, Marie, I think that's uh, really interesting. Jay Pulaski here. I know we like to talk geopolitics. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I think that Joe Biden is a fighter, right? And all this pressure is forcing him to dig in uh, deeper. Uh, you talk about the down ballots. It's interesting, right? Because when you look at the Senate races in the swing states, Democrats are polling considerably above the Republican candidates. So in the Senate, which is, which is arguably more important for the Democrats to hold, uh, than taking the House, 
Uh, they actually seem to be doing well. Biden, truly, as you note, is not polling as well as those candidates. So I wonder if, if we're not getting over our skis a little bit in talking about Biden uh, stepping away. Well, you're 100 percent right that Biden is a fighter. And this is a man who's fueled really by the complications in his life. And he talks about the trial tribulations of his life and then he's always able to overcome it. He thinks he's still in the best position to beat Donald Trump. When it comes to some of these swing states, this is where he's really struggling. But you're right. A lot of this is in the margin of error when you look at some of the different polling. But that is why you see the concern of individuals on the ballot, whether they're running for Senate, whether they're running for Congress. They think that Biden is actually potentially going to hurt their chances. There's something else that I think we should take into consideration. Biden has changed his message three different times when asked what would it take to drop out. When he sat down with ABC in that interview, he said he could only be convinced if the Lord Almighty came down and said, Joe, get out of the race. Then the NATO press conference, about a week later, he was pressed on this issue. I was in the room. This was all anyone cared about. And he said, no, there's nothing that can make me get out of the race, except maybe they came back and they said there's no way to win. The polls, he says if his team came to him and said the polls show there's no way to win. Then in an interview with BET that was on display last night, it was broadcasting, it was supposed to be this counter-programming to the RNC, he said if he had some sort of medical condition that emerged, if someone, if doctors came to me and said, you got this problem and that problem, Anyway, he said that would potentially be a reason why I drop out. So I do think there is a little bit more of wiggle room now because Joe Biden himself has changed the reasoning why he would get out of this race. And right after we saw those comments about the potential of a medical problem taking him out of the race, he gets a COVID diagnosis. Can we just look at the compare and contrast? It could not be starker. Saturday evening, an attempted assassination on the former president of the United States, walks away from it with his fists raised, American flag waving in the background, compared to say this. Amory, I understand it's brutal, but look at the pictures of yesterday evening, yesterday afternoon. President Biden contracting COVID, no mask, struggling to walk up the steps of Air Force One. A little bit later on this evening, this president won't be able to counter program the former president of the United States when he addresses the RNC. How stark is that contrast gonna be? It's incredibly stark because you also have a Republican Party that's trying to tone down the rhetoric at this RNC, and they're trying to unify, really, the MAGA wing of the party, this Trumpism that many hawks and many fiscally conservative and uh, more moderate Republicans were hoping, potentially, this would basically no longer be the brand of the Republican Party unless Trump was top of the ticket. But yesterday, in that speech from J.D. Vance, that just showed that MAGA and Trumpism is here to stay. The populist wing of this Republican Party is now the majority of the Republican Party with this ticket. And this evening, we're just going to see that tonight with President uh, Trump coming to the stage and formally accepting his party's nominee to uh, face off against potentially what will be Joe Biden November 5th. And he's probably going to put his fist in the air and say, fight, 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 like he did after that former uh, that assassination attempt on Saturday. And then in contrast to President Joe Biden, who cannot counter programming because he's self-isolating in Delaware and then it's just a drip treat of reports that members of his own party, senior members of his own party, and some of them who really love the president, like Nancy Pelosi, are telling him, we think it's time you step aside. Let's get into that address a little bit later. Let's talk about that and finish there. I want to talk about policy. On Wall Street, for a long, long time, we've always thought of the Republican Party as pro-business. And you and I have been talking about this now for a number of weeks. We've been talking about how pro-business this Republican administration may actually turn out to be. What is going to be in the address a little bit later to maybe settle that score on that front? Well, it's very different, I think, if you hear what J.D. Vance has to say, his VP pick, and what President Trump has to say. So J.D. Vance last night said this is no longer the party of Wall Street. This is the party of the working class. He called out auto workers in Michigan, factory workers in Wisconsin, and energy workers in Pennsylvania. 
Donald Trump likely chose him to park him in these three states to try to win the election. Because if Joe Biden cannot hold the Rust Belt, if he cannot hold the blue wall, then he is not winning re-election to see the White House again. But Donald Trump is going to go to the stage today after an interview with Bloomberg Businessweek, and he said he'd actually like the corporate tax rate at 15 percent. So I am struggling in all of my conversations here. And I had this conversation yesterday with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who they think Virginia is definitely in play when it comes to the Republican Party about which Republican Party is good for business. And honestly, Jonathan, I still don't know the answer. It really depends who you ask, because someone like J.D. Vance wants to see a higher corporate tax rate, while the top of the ticket wants as low as 15 percent. So we're still struggling to figure this out. One thing that I'm continuously told when I ask about some of the um, rhetoric from J.D. Vance about the business community, everyone says the same thing. It's Trump's party. J.D. Vance is going to get in line. AMH, on the latest of the Republican convention, Amory, thank you. Jay, that's a question we keep asking, just how business friendly is this government going to be if they get back into power? Um, I, I think that uh, there's a clear distinction between the two candidates and their economic policy mix. Biden has been probably the most successful president in terms of economic policy and outcomes in 50 years or more, right? Um, and President, uh, former President Trump, I think is uh, his policy mix is basically fiscal incontinence, where you're talking about mass deportation to destroy the labor market. You're talking about raising tariffs 60 percent. You're talking about uh, cu extending tax cuts. You're talking about cutting taxes even further. So I think the situation is setting up for really a, could be a significant shift and a significant surprise in terms of the dollar. Because if the dollar weakens when we blow out the fiscal deficit here, the yep. Fed is in a box. Uh, I think people start to get worried about policy confusion and chaos, which was kind of the motif of the Trump first administration. Then I think you have a situation where you have a massively overowned asset, which is U.S. financial assets represented by the dollar that could roll over. It's at 104, 103. Uh, people target 90. Um, as a reasonable place if it really does uh, start to sell off. 103.83 right now on the dollar index. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. United Airlines shares falling in the pre-market. The company reporting that third quarter profit will fall short of Wall Street estimates. The airline saying adjusted earnings will be up to $3.25 a share in the current period. That's lower than the average $3.38 analysts were expecting. United echoing rival Delta saying that low-cost carriers are slashing prices as they try to fill excess seats this summer. And that is weighing on the entire industry, they say. NBC reporting that New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez plans to resign. The report coming after the powerful Democrat was found guilty of federal corruption charges earlier this week. A chorus of senators, including Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, called on Menendez to step down after the verdict. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy said the Senate should expel Menendez if he didn't comply. Murphy will pick a replacement to serve out the remainder of Menendez's term. And play is underway at the British Open Golf Championship at the Royal Troon Golf Club in Scotland. Englishman Matt Wallace shot out to an early lead, followed closely by American Justin Thomas. World number one Scotty Scheffler is once again the favorite for the tournament. He's the first since Tiger Woods in 2013 to be the opening favorite at all four majors in one year. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahara, thank you. More from Yahara in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, the chip makers taking a dive. Yeah, Nasdaq is down a lot, the market's down a lot, but it's really dragged down by these select few stocks. We'll talk about those select few stocks up next on the program, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live from New York, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500 attempting to bounce back. Not much of a bounce. We're firmer here by 0.06%. Under surveillance this morning, the chip makers taking a dive. 
we're seeing big moves at the stock level. Yeah, Nasdaq is down a lot, the market's down a lot, but it's really dragged down by these select few stocks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's still very much an idiosyncratically driven, yeah. fundamentally driven sell-off rather than a macro, you know, everything sells up together type of move. So here's the latest. The Nasdaq 100 looking to rebound from its worst day since 2022 on renewed concerns of trade tensions with China. Jay Pulaski of TPW Advisory is still optimistic writing this. They say rotation is the lifeblood of bull markets and it sure seems like a broadening out and rotation to X-Tech would go a long way to sustaining the bull. Jay's with us around the table through the rest of this hour. Jay, I want to talk about one name in particular before we broaden out ourselves. <laughs> I want to talk about Taiwan Semi. Mm. Taiwan Semi gets hammered yesterday, but this is a company putting up real numbers. Just this morning, this is what we learned. They now expect sales to grow more than the maximum, mid 20% it had guided towards previously. Were these a buy yesterday for you? Yes, they were, uh, John. I think, you know, markets had really extended. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? So when you're up 20, 30% in a matter of a month or two, you, come, you pull back 8% in a day. That's just kind of normal. But the point you're making is fundamentally, these are solid, fast, rapidly growing stories, which are unique in the world right? You're talking about uh, forecasts that were made a couple months ago, and they're already beating them and raising them. And this is a story we've seen with NVIDIA and other chip uh, makers that are involved in AI uh, for a year now, right? And so you've had massive moves, but the stocks are actually cheaper now than they were a year ago because earnings have outpaced the stock price appreciation. And so we have been and continue to be big believers in AI and big believers in the idea of the pick and shovel, right? The pick and shovel for AI is the semiconductor space. And so when you have pullbacks, those are opportunities to add in our view. So this is what we've been rotating away from in the last week. Let's talk yep. about what we've been rotating towards, yep. small caps. We've had questions around this table, conversations about whether we're going into a small cap presidency with Donald Trump, the president in the White House heading up the United States and driving small business in America and punishing big business, big tech in particular. How do you frame that one? Yeah, I, I look at it differently. I look at it that small caps are big beneficiaries of lower interest rates, right? 50% of small cap debt is, is floating rate versus 10% for large cap. So they are big beneficiaries. And so you, we've seen this movie. We saw it in the fall, right? Small caps had a 27% move in three months, October to December. I think they're set up for something similar. Uh, small caps today trade at 10 times 2025 earnings on a median basis. That is extremely cheap. They're massively underowned, right? There's a massive short, which is why this has moved so fast, right? This is always the case, right? It's a massive short covering. But you have fundamentals, again, like TSMC, to support it. The other thing that I think is really, really interesting, John, is that things are broadening out, right? We just updated our model portfolios at TPW Advisory, and when I go through all the positions, all the indices, and all the things we're thinking about. And what's interesting to me is that thematics are breaking out, right? You look at biotech. You look at things like robotics. You look at things like security, cybersecurity. They're all breaking out to new all-time highs. You also look at things like infrastructure and CapEx, right? We saw the industrial production numbers yesterday. Infrastructure, PAVE, all-time highs. XLI, all-time highs. Grid, which is a smart uh, energy uh, for the, uh, for the uh, grid system, all-time highs. And so to me, you're looking at a situation where there's multiple parts of the market starting to move in unison higher. And it's not just the Magnificent Seven anymore. And to me, that's a much more robust, much healthier market. Now, as we talked about at the open, whether with a Donald Trump, should he win, whether that sustains, I think is a very real question. That's a good thing, so long as we aren't going into an economic downturn. Just cyclicals, for an example. Let's take the likes of Delta, United in the last 24 hours. They're warning about discounting. Mm -hmm. They're warning about driving down prices going through the summer. That shouldn't be happening if this economy is holding up, should it? Yeah, it's so interesting, right? Because I, I, we were in airlines and jets uh, for quite some time as a reopening play coming out of COVID. And they really just didn't work. And they still don't work, even though you, you read about tourism, U.S. Uh, citizens going abroad in record numbers this year. And yet it obviously doesn't seem to be enough uh, for the airlines to make money. And so I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, but I think it's an anomaly. If you look at broader issues, like you look at retail sales the other day, yep. consumer is still strong, right? You have, you have real wage growth. You have record low unemployment or close to it. You have uh, disposable income rising. 
And so consumption, I think, is, is, is fine. And what's interesting is, are we having the manufacturing sector starting to catch up and give us another leg? Based on your dollar call, that window to travel might be closing. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Jay Filoski <laughs> sticking with us. Coming up on the program, deep discounting, taking a bite out of the outlook for U.S. airlines. We'll catch up with Sheila Kaolu of Jefferies up next. United attempted to bounce back firmer by a third of 1% in early trading. From New York City with futures just about unchanged on the S&P, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, good morning to you all and welcome to the program. Equity Futures this Thursday morning look a little something like this. We're just about firmer by 0.04%. The Nasdaq 100 attempting to bounce back, firmer by a quarter of 1% following the worst day since December 20. 22. Chipmakers got hammered. Jay Pulaski ran the table saying yesterday's price action was a buy for him. I want to turn to the bond market going into jobless claims about two hours away. The two year 446, the 10 year near lows we haven't seen since March. 418.27 is where the 10 year is. Bouncing a little bit on the yield side of things up two basis points. Inching higher. Jobless claims the one to watch. Just how stable, how strong is this labour market? Encouraging news on the jobless claim side of things last week. Can we repeat the act? this week. Switch on the board and turn the page to foreign exchange. Jay, we've got to talk about this. Your call on the US dollar. We've had individual after individual around this table talk up the strength of the US dollar off the back of Trump policy. Higher tariffs, higher tariffs. They're saying looser fiscal policy, higher yields, higher rates. All of that is going to lead to a stronger dollar. You take completely the other side <laughs> of this trade. Why? Yeah, I do, John, because I think, look, the dollar is the most overowned asset in the world, right? We, the U.S. has been the dominant uh, place to be in terms of equity markets for the last 15 years coming out of the bottom in 2009. So we have an overowned asset. You have the Fed getting ready to cut rates, so the dollar is starting to soften. You have markets not quite ready to fully price in a Trump presidency, notwithstanding all the talk, right? Polling is still very tight within the margin of error. And so we're thinking about it, and we think about uh, the Trump policy mix, which is cutting taxes, raising tariffs, firing thousands of people, and really messing up the U.S. economy. And that's not just my point of view. It's, it's Goldman Sachs, it's Moody's, it's the Peterson Institute, 16 Nobel laureates. Basically, the list goes on and on. It's pretty clear that that policy mix is not great for the U.S. economy. And therefore, I think you have a situation where people will start to say, OK, look, I'm going to go elsewhere because the rest of the world is doing pretty well. And therefore, you have a situation where there's an opportunity emerging outside the U.S. And as we touched on at the open, right, the market is not just the U.S. doing well. All country world index is at an all time high. Acqui X US is at a two year high. So other markets are doing well. Other opportunities exist around the world. And I think that setup where you have fiscal incontinence in a second Trump administration, as you did in the first, could lead to a weaker dollar, which would conti could continue to fall, even if the Fed has to pivot and raise rates after starting to cut rates in the fall of this year. You got it. This is the second time I've mentioned her name this week. Tina, there is no alternative. How many times have we heard that with yeah. regards to the U.S.? <laughs> you said elsewhere. Money yeah. goes elsewhere. You mentioned yeah. the equity market. Can we yeah. talk about foreign exchange? What's the elsewhere? Yeah. What am I buying? What are those trades denominated in? Yeah, well, there, you look at the developed countries. You have the euro, which is considerably considered about 10 or 15 percent undervalued. You have the yen, which Japan will be raising interest rates. Fair value at the yen is considered around 100. It's right now at 156. Massive, massive uh, potential there. And you have places in the emerging markets where the dollar could uh, weaken considerably. You look at Brazil, you look at Mexico, you look at some of the countries in Southeast Asia. And so arguably you have an opportunity where there are significant growth and earnings potential. People just talk about earnings in the US, but look, Europe is forecast to grow double digit earnings this year, next year, and 2026. China is forecast to grow double-digit earnings this year and next year. China trades at six, eight times earnings at this point. For good reason. So, well, arguably for good reason, but again, in the price. And you and I have talked about this, right? Many times. Uh, it's in the price. And so uh, the opportunity, the risk-reward seems pretty appealing uh, in some of these places versus the U.S., where it's already fully in the price, at least 
certainly for parts of the market. The euro right now, 109.32. Let's get you some top stories. Under Savannah's this morning, President Biden facing renewed calls to end his re-election bid. ABC News reporting that, uh, that both Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries indicated to Biden that it might be better to step aside. Biden taking a break from the campaign trail after being diagnosed with COVID just yesterday. Jay, we talked about this a few times already in the last 30 minutes. Does this man, does this president get to November at the top of that ticket or does he step aside? Yeah, my view is that uh, Joe Biden will be the, the nominee uh, in, in November. Uh, I think he's a fighter. Uh, I think people like Joe Biden as a fighter. And as we've talked about, right, polls are not anywhere near as negative as kind of the, the perspective in the story around Joe Biden. If you look at 538 electoral college polling, Biden actually wins 277 to 263. If you look at polling, whether swing state or nationally, it's within the margin of error, one or two points, two to three points difference. So, and I think that's what's gonna keep him in the race, right? It's not just him being a fighter, but it's him looking at uh, the polls and saying, look guys, I'm in it, notwithstanding all this negativity. And by the way, the other thing people need to remember is President Trump is not popular, has not been popular, is not popular, has never polled or received more than 47 or 48% of the vote. If you look at the RNC, everyone's talking about the RNC, Emory is even there, right? Five million fewer viewers um, at the opening night than four years ago. People don't, there's not a, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. And so to me, uh, this is a little bit of a tempest in a, in a teacup. And you know, I've used that phrase before. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's gonna pass. And I think that uh, you have, a real, you have uh, a real opportunity where the Democrats are energized, where abortion is on the ballot, where you see signs at the RNC of mass deportation now. Mass deportation now in America. OK, I mean, I don't think that's really going to be exciting. J.D. Vance, abortion and all, you know, forbidden under all circumstances. I don't think that's popular in America. So to me, there's a real opportunity and I'm betting on this. Right. My view, just to finish real quick. OK, well, my, what's the bet? What does that even look like? What are you betting on? Okay, exactly. So my bet is, as we've talked about before, a global macro blue sky environment 2023 to 2027. That envisions an extension of the Biden policy mix, which has been so successful that the U.S. economy is the envy of the developed country world post-COVID. President Trump comes in, uh, you know, as a convicted felon, as an arguably an insurrectionist, uh, and returns to office uh, with a fiscal incontinence policy. I think that blue sky, at least for the United States, goes out the window. And whether we talk about the airlines, you know, sure. Americans are tourists. Again in a second. Americans are tourists. They're going abroad. Maybe it's MAGA turns to hello world and U.S. investors and foreign investors go to the rest of the world. You mentioned the convention. Let's talk about Senator J.D. Vance and his address just yesterday evening. How this organization, this party is ultimately going to commit to the working man. These comments just yesterday happened to further Trump's economic message in battleground states like Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. We've heard this populist language again and again. It's about the working man. It's not about big business anymore in the Republican Party. Jay, the trade that I've heard, and I think you'll find this pair trade quite funny, long Bitcoin, short meta. Is the trade ultimately going into this administration if we get there? What do you make of that? Does that make sense? Well, it does in a way because President Trump has promised, former President Trump has promised retribution. So that's retribution against Meta because uh, Zuckerberg was the last platform to let him back on. And Bitcoin, definitely. I mean, I was at a dinner with some guys last night who were in the business and Bitcoin was the topic of the day. And so it makes sense from a do weak dollar perspective for me. Um, but I, I really don't see it uh, otherwise. I think the trade, the big trade is dollar down. The big trade is what happens to bonds. Bonds have been in a tight trading range. Equities have broken out around the world. Yep. Bonds in a tr tight trading range the last two years. Which way do bonds break, right? If it's a weak dollar, bonds break higher, rates go higher. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to be a, a great environment for U.S. assets. Bitcoin might be fine, but let's be honest, Bitcoin is, a, is you know, 
is a tiny little thumbnail on the uh, on the global uh, financial asset stage. So a lot there on foreign exchange. We talked about the airlines a few times. Let's do that again. United Airlines saying third quarter profit will fall short of estimates as U.S. carriers slash ticket prices in a bid to lure domestic travelers. United's outlook echoing an earlier warning in the last week from Delta. Alaska also offering a similar outlook. Sheila Kaolu of Jefferies has a buy rating and a $65 price target on United and joins us now for more. Sheila, it's good to see you. I've got to say, I was scratching my head last week. What's going on with these airlines at a time where it's summer and I thought demand was good and the consumer was strong? Demand is good. TSA volumes are at all-time highs, but what we're seeing is pricing in the domestic economy is pretty weak. And the airlines are telling you that's a capacity issue. Capacity in Q2 is up 5% year-on-year, um, but prices are down low single digits. Main cabin prices for Delta are down high single digits. Lower-cost carriers like uh, Spirit Airlines are reporting 11% down year on year. So that's pretty bad given pricing for airline ticket prices are already deflationary. So it's price that's the weakness. Airlines are blaming it on overcapacity, not consumer weakness. I think it's a case of the, the latter rather than the former. So, Sheila, uh, we used to play Jets, which is the ETF for airlines, right, uh, as a reopening play. And it really didn't work, which was kind of surprising, right? It hasn't really worked. Airlines haven't really done much for quite a period of time. Is this something that you think is going to last? Or is there an opportunity here, like if you're a long-term investor, is this an opportunity to step in? I think the, the perspective on airlines is they're super cyclical and they're not doing themselves justice right now. Although Delta and United are still holding up double-digit mid-teens margins, that's pretty good mm -hmm. for a company that trades at five times earnings, even below the Chinese market. <laughs> and so these things trade at a 50 to 70 percent discount to the market. Their valuation isn't going to go lower, but investors are making the bet that earnings revisions are going to go lower. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to see these prices, they will. My focus is once Boeing gets its act together, and it will one day, then we have more planes in the market and we're not going to see capacity trimmed into the second half and into 2025. Mm -hmm. And airlines are being super cautious. It's going to be interesting to see what United says about that because Delta is saying capacity is going to be trimmed. We've seen Q3 schedules come in, mm -hmm. you know, Americans cutting transatlantic uh, flights as well. So we'll see what happens and how quickly capacity rationalizes. You mentioned American. American has executed really, really poorly over the last 12 months. It felt like a lost summer already for them. It's we've lost. heard from Delta. We've heard from United. How much worse are things going to be for American Airlines if they face this as well? I think United's going to be the best print out of all these guys, because once we see what American and Southwest ticket prices are, I think it's going to be much more disappointing than what we're seeing. Um, United's holding up better, especially given their premium seat count, their transatlantic exposure, the highest in the group. So that helps offset some of the weakness we're seeing in domestic markets. As Also, their coastal hubs are better positioned because you're seeing a lot of the low-cost carriers in the short-haul South America, uh, Southern markets. Look at these year-to-date moves. United, double digits, up. Delta, up by 14%. This is even with the losses of the last week or so. American Airlines is down 20% year-to-date. What on earth do they do to turn this around? They took the wrong approach, and that's why they've sort of revised their management team. They really honed in on regional capacity, restoring regional capacity, and that should have been positive for them, but it just turns out that they were in the wrong markets where they saw more low-cost competition. So I don't know what they need to do to turn it around, but they need to follow some of the steps that United and Delta are doing, whether it's uh, having a better loyalty program, uh, performing in the right areas of the country as well. Sheila, it's good to see you. I'm part of the loyalty program, so I've got thoughts. I'll share them later. <laughs> Sheila Kohli of Jefferies, thank you very much. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. President Joe Biden testing positive for COVID-19. The White House saying he's experiencing mild symptoms and is planning to carry out his full duties while self-isolating in Delaware. His diagnosis coming at a critical time on the campaign trail, Biden canceling an appearance before a key Latino advocacy group as the Democratic revolt against his candidacy, candidacy picks up steam once more. The Financial Times is reporting that Warner Brothers is considering splitting its streaming and studio businesses from its legacy television networks. CEO David Sasloff is weighing options including asset sales and spinning out the Warner Brothers movie studio and Max streaming into a new company and free of the current $39 billion debt load. The FT saying representatives were not immediately available for comment. 
And Citadel founder Ken Griffin has reportedly paid Sotheby's nearly $45 million for an almost complete Stegosaurus skeleton, the most ever for a fossil at auction. The 150 million year old dinosaur nicknamed Apex is more than 11 feet tall and 27 feet long. Griffin has a history of trophy purchases outbidding crypto invert investors back in 2021 to buy a first edition copy of the U.S. Constitution. Griffin reportedly plans to put Apex on display at a U.S. museum. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Unbelievable. Yahara, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next on this program, a soft landing in sight. I believe the current data are consistent with achieving a soft landing. While I don't believe we've reached our final destination, I do believe we are getting closer to the time when a cut in the policy rate is warranted. That conversation up next, live from New York City. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. Waking up Thursday morning, good morning to all. A sneak peek of the price action, firmer by 0.1% on the S&P. Bond yields a little bit higher, up two or three basis points. The 10-year, 418.46. Under surveillance this morning, a soft landing in sight. I believe the current data are consistent with achieving a soft landing. And I'll be looking for data over the next couple of months to buttress that view. So while I don't believe we have reached our final destination, I do believe we are getting closer to the time when a cut in the policy rate is warranted. We're getting closer. Here's the latest. Another round of jobless claims coming at 8.30 Eastern time as investors firm up expectations for a rate cut in September. Before that, we'll get an ECB rate decision with economists expecting Christine Lagarde to keep rates on hold after June's initial rate cut. Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen expecting this, a super September of rate cuts. He writes the following. I think the US, UK and ECB do need to cut because if you leave it too long, the consumer will start to cry out loudly. Luke joins us now for more. Luke, do you hear any crying just yet? I'm crying, Jonathan. Don't you worry about that. I, th I think there are signs of it. We saw unemployment pop up a little bit uh, in both the UK and US. And let's be honest, Eurozone has not been particularly firm in terms of employment. And really, if people are worried about their finances and you're starting to see this creeping increase in unemployment, that starts feeding through as well in terms of people feeling not great about the future. And that's really all we need to see. I mean, things like your 30-year fixed mortgages in the in the US, Jonathan, much like yours, I'm sure, um, that hurts too. It, it stops people moving around when mortgage rates have jumped as high as they have. And we also saw uh, reports out of Europe this week that people's financing costs, um, more generally, whether that's loans or whether that's corporates, have been bouncing quite a bit higher too. So Crystal Wall is probably right, we're gonna get a soft landing, but the risk of that turning into something not so soft, I think has to increase the longer interest rates stay at these table mountain levels. Luke, Jay Pulaski here. Um, the market is pricing in roughly two cuts uh, for the Fed uh, by the, over the course of the rest of this year. Is that your view as well, or do you think there's more to come? And as a follow-on, we've talked a lot uh, this morning about the risk of the Fed being put in a box by a Trump victory and people getting concerned about fiscal policy in the United States. Are you concerned at all that the Fed starts to cut and then is forced to reverse itself and raise rates to protect a weak dollar, let's say in the first quarter of next year? It's a really good chance, isn't it? I, I think actually perhaps there's something something else there as well. For you know, if you get this protectionism comes in, the, the ten percent tariff that the Trump and his team have talked about on everything, maybe that's a bit of a growth shock for Europe, rather than it's directly inflationary for the US. If that's the case, yeah, maybe the fall the Fed takes a little longer to cut. But if Europe's struggling with growth, maybe you don't get like this really big big shift in, in, in relative foreign exchange rates, maybe it gives you a little bit of a firmer dollar, but it's not too much. Um, if, if you've got all that going on and the fiscal concerns people have got with the amount of debt that the US federal government has and the fiscal deficits that they're too, possibly it all balances out. But 
fundamentals matter, economics matter, and over the next 12 months, rates have to come down. And it, it may be that Trump pauses that, a, a Trump election pauses that, but I don't think it stops it, no. There's way too much Euro optimism on this programme in the last hour, so let me sort of balance this out. <laughs> Luke, I've got to say, never mind the growth shock, the China shock, volume two, and maybe on steroids. Luke, if you get the US administration cranking up tariffs in America, everybody's complaining about one thing. Spring meetings earlier this year, World Bank, IMF, all the officials are running around talking about the same thing, Chinese overcapacity. And the only economy, yeah. the only administration really doing anything about it is going to be the US administration. Who's going to weak the overcapacity? Luke, it's going to be Europe. That's just sort of the logical yeah. way of thinking about this. That's not just the China shock volume two on steroids. That's a deflationary stock for the European Central Bank. Is that going to be good for growth? You're already starting to see cap you coming down across the whole eurozone, Jonathan. So it's... It's quite stark. I was looking through Oxford economics charts on the Eurozone over the last couple of days, and it's coming down quite a lot. We're into the like early 80s, late 70s in terms of capacity utilisation. And so that could feed into it quite a lot if, if we get this growth shock in Europe due to Trump, Trump protectionism. So, yeah, it's, it's really hard to be positive on the euro, isn't it? Really hard at this point. And I think the ECB may well be a little bit low in cutting and not doing anything today, but it feels like going to have to catch up quite quickly over the next 12 months. Luke, your long duration, the US, UK and Eurozone, given the conversation we've just had, is there a degree of confidence that you have some greater confidence on one of those regions to be long duration? OK, admittedly, we're both from the UK, Jonathan, but a little unfair, UK duration is our favourite. Um, the stability that we're seeing from the UK government, which seems quite a nice change, doesn't it? And I think investors actually kind of appreciate that too. We've got a lot of election worries and volatility around Europe. Um, funny enough, I've just taken off some of our long European duration this morning uh, and moved that into the UK as well. But I'm still happy having some US, but that has to be in the context of twos, tens steepening up uh, in the US in particular. But I think UK right now seems a pretty good place to be at around 4% yield when we could be getting into the early 3% yield by the end of next year. That still seems a good place to take that duration view. Luke, it's good to catch up, sir. Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen. What a compare and contrast where we are right now in 2024 compared to where we were, say, in 2016. I think we all remember that morning. I was on set. It was on air with Guy Johnson in the other studio. It was about 4, 5 a.m. Eastern time. And the former president, Donald Trump, comes out and starts talking about infrastructure spending. And all of a sudden, this market starts to turn. Equity futures start to rally. And it was after months of guest after guest coming on programs like this, saying that Donald Trump would be bad for financial markets. And then we absolutely ripped. Jay, let's finish there. Why is it any different this time around? Why is it different in 2024 compared to, say, where we were in late 2016? Well, markets are at all-time highs, right? Uh, we've had a situation where stocks have done very, very well. You have the U.S. has been massively owned by uh, foreign investors as well as domestic investors. And so I think you're in a situation where the, the risks of a uh, problem developing as opposed to a continuation is significant. The way I look at things, as, as, I, as we touched on, right, uh, the U.S. as a, its economic policy results and policies over the last three years post-COVID are the envy of the developed market world. Better growth, lower inflation, better employment, like one, two, three. OK, so we're in a good situation. The risk of a massive policy shift, which President, former President Trump, should he get reelected, would engender, I think, is problematic, as we've talked about you know, several times here. Uh, to me, what's interesting is that we wrote our 2024 outlook back in October, right? Four global macro surprises, lower inflation, better productivity, return to stability, an early cycle. All those things are playing out around the world. And the risk is that uh, a Trump administration with its policy mix, I think puts a wrench into that whole process and really causes people to reconsider. And if that does uh, turn out to be the case, you have a situation where the U.S. is the most expensive market in the world with the most performance. Just as a quick uh, example, the last 10 years, emerging market equities up 5%, EFA up 30%, U.S. up 175%.
right? So there, the U.S. is on a spike uh, versus everyone else. And as I said before, bond market is in a two-year trading range. How the bond market reacts here, how the dollar reacts, I think is really going to tell the tale. And it's not, in my view, a constructive one if former President Trump gets reelected. We'll talk to you again before November, but let's do this on election night. Perfect. I think we probably should. I love it. We'll get that intraday chart of futures up and we'll see how this shakes out. Perfect. Jay Pulaski of TPW. Jay, thank you. Appreciate a very different perspective on things right now. A lot of you I know will take the other side of the trade. That right there is a market. Equity futures on the S&P 500, firmer by 0.1%. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg Surveillance, we'll catch up with Tom Kennedy of JP Morgan Asset Management. We'll speak to Tobin Marcus of Wolf Research, Sabadra Japa of SockGen. There's a lot to discuss. AMH Anne-Marie still with us. She's standing by in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to get the latest from the Republican convention, just ahead of an address from the former president, Donald Trump. What a summer already. Where are we? July 18th. We've got a long way to go. Four more months of this from New York City. Jay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. The pleasure. second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. is certainly moving in the right direction and cooperate. I think it's not there yet for a July cut, but I do think that for September it's setting up pretty well. We don't think the economy is slowing that much or that quickly that we should be seeing across the board cutting in risk in portfolios. The big risk out there for markets in general is that inflation finds a home, but it's too high. The top priority right now is inflation. Inflation's coming down better than the FOMC expected. We're seeing inflation come down in conjunction with the economy, but simultaneously the economy hasn't collapsed. So it makes these rate cut expectations we're seeing now much more plausible. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your day ahead shaping up as follows. At 8.15 Eastern Time, a rate decision from the European Central Bank. 15 minutes after, we'll get jobless claims in America, and then you'll hear from President Christine Lagarde of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Germany. Then attention shifts to the politics later on. The former president, Donald Trump, an address in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the Republican Convention. With us around the table, I'm pleased to say Danny Berger dropping by. Danny, for that day ahead right there, what jumps out to you? It's got to be the RNC, but I'd rather talk about the market at this point. I know we'll get to the politics, John, so I'll do that. But it's really about this earnings season. Can the fundamentals calm us down from the politics? We had a flick of that with TSMC today, but expectations are high. So can it live up to those? This is a market that's willing to punish companies who don't meet those expectations. Well, let's talk about some of those companies and the way that this earnings season started. It didn't start that well. It started with Delta. Delta of all companies coming out. And I know this is going to sound super odd to anyone that's traveled recently. The airlines are coming out and saying there's steep discounting going on and that there's too much capacity. Now, for anyone who's traveled over the last month, you might have a very different opinion on this. But we heard it from Delta last week. We heard it from United last night. And Alaska is saying the same thing. Yeah, and Lufthansa, so it's an international thing. And this is sort of the oddity of having a market that's run up a lot, and now it's the entirety of the market that's run up a lot, is that we're in a position where we've traded off vibes, some would say, that we've run up to a lot, and now we have the earnings season. It makes us much more likely to sell the news, and that's what we're getting. We're getting this weakness in consumer stocks that we didn't think there was weakness there. The story had been the dollar was much stronger internationally, so everybody and their cousin was going to Europe, that's now being questioned, and that's a problem. Do you want to talk about the politics? Yeah, let's do it. The trumped up Trump trade, small caps, the small cap presidency. I think we have to start, not with a former president, but with a sitting president. The growing pressure on him. What an evening we saw. Diagnosed with COVID, stepping back from the campaign, self-isolating, a very, very difficult walk, it seemed, up the steps into Air Force One. None of those imageries are going to do them any favours at all. And then you go through report one by one, ABC News suggesting that Democratic leadership are piling on the pressure to step aside. Then beyond that, CNN, Nancy Pelosi, essentially saying the same thing to the president, you can't win. Semaphore yesterday afternoon saying the campaign funding was drying up. It's getting more and more difficult for the sitting president to stand the race. You know what it almost felt like? It felt like people inside the Democratic Party were going around to every single news outlet saying, hey, who wants a scoop? Who wants a leak? Who wants to hear about how we're feeling about President Biden? 
And that even gets to this more stark split screen, not even that we don't have Biden able to get up into campaign in the middle of the RNC, but the fact that you have an RNC where previous never Trumpers are lining up one by one, throwing their support behind the president. And meanwhile, you have the Democratic Party speaking to everyone that they can, leaking information that they want President Biden to step down. It is a vision of unity and a vision of dividedness. You know what the next step for all of this is? They've told him privately, then they've started to leak the stories. That's step two. Step three is to do this publicly. And we'll work out how close we are to step three, I guess, with Amri a little bit later in the program. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, firmer by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. And the bond market yields are higher by two basis points on a 10-year, 418. Had Jake Pulaski of TPW very opinionated on where this US dollar is going to go. Very, very bearish on the US dollar. More on that a little bit later. Euro dollar right now, 109.33. On the screen, a stronger US dollar. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Tom Kennedy of JP Morgan as the Nasdaq 100 has its worst day since 20. 2022. Tobin Marcus of Wolf Research amid mounting pressure for President Biden to drop out and to badger a of Sokgen as traders boost bets on a September rate cut. We begin with our top story this hour, the Nasdaq 100 coming off the back of its worst day since September 22. Tom Kennedy of JP Morgan writing this, the great equity rotation that everyone expected, but wow, this is fierce. Prior to Tuesday, the Russell 2000 outperformed the S&P 500 by 10% over just five days. That's never happened. Tom joins us now for more. Tom, good morning. Good morning. How sustainable is this rotation? I think it is sustainable and I think it's what we've all expected to happen amid a soft landing in the U.S. economy. If we look back to just last month, the divergence between Nasdaq and everything else was becoming very stark. And you can go one or two ways with that. You can see tech fall down or the rest of the world catch up and the, the latter is happening. I think it's quite positive and durable. There's three pillars here. Rates, earnings, politics. Let's park the politics for now. Okay. And let's park the rate story. Most people think the Fed's about to cut in September. Let's focus on the second one, earnings. Are earnings going to support this story, do you think? Because what we're hearing from some of these airlines, other <coughs> companies as well, not small caps, I know, yep. but they're coming out and saying that maybe the consumer's not in that great a position. Let's start with it has to support it, right? You have to see earnings support. Look back to last year. Magnificent 7 grew earnings at 33%. Everything else, more or less zero. We've been expecting some convergence. It's taking a little bit longer. I think you're going to see it this quarter, where you're going to see the broadening out in earnings and start to see single-digit earnings growth start to creep higher, maybe even get to high single digits by the end of the year. There's this argument out there, which Goldman Sachs' Scott Rubner has, that take all the pillars that John says and yeah. says, all that's already priced in. What we've seen over the past week means that all of the good news is in the share price. Therefore, I'm not buying the dip. What do you make of that kind of argument? I think this rotation and how fierce it was is showing you that it wasn't in the price. Folks like me have been coming on your show all year saying, oh, the broadening out's going to happen. It's going to be great. And then you, it could just be positioning that you're seeing this sharp reversal and a historic re, um, broadening out in, in performance. But it's not in the price. And if, if we see earnings surprise to the upside, valuations are completely reasonable, if not wildly cheap relative to history, depending on how you look at it. Relative to history, the small cap index is about as cheap as it's been since 2001 just forward PEs relative to the S&P 500. So that history relative to fundamentals, if we can see earnings broaden out, this should keep going. Okay, so maybe the small caps were mispriced. But on the other side of things, I know yesterday helped a little bit, but otherwise we still have very richly priced big cap tech stocks, right. MAG7. And still the flows into the ETFs there have been unrelenting even recently. I think one out of every $4 has gone into one of those ETFs yeah. that tracks a market cap weighted S&P or NASDAQ. So is that part of the market vulnerable? Um, I think on a valuation perspective, yes. The flows you're seeing in JP Morgan Wealth, one of the biggest pools of wealth assets in the world, we're seeing the same flows as well. People really believing in this AI trade and starting to get comfortable with even that AI trade has to broaden out. I have to own more than just my hyperscalers that I've owned for the last 15 years. I need to, earn, I need to own the energy infrastructure to support AI demands of the future. I need to own the infrastructure and land to get data centers. So it's, it's a more industrial policy beyond the AI. And at the risk of wading too far into politics, it looks like this is a bipartisan measure from President Trump and President Biden to support the critical industries of America, whether that be defense, energy, supply chain. You dipped a toe into the water. Let's jump right in. Elections don't matter. How many times have we all heard that phrase? Of course. That charts in America just sort of go up and to the right. You've all seen the charts, right? They don't matter. U.S. elections don't matter. We've all heard this. Is it different this time? I mean, you'd be forgiven if you thought it was, for sure. History tells us it doesn't matter. The S&P 500, election year or non-election year, more or less the same performance. 
think what's different from our perspective this go round is how bipartisan industrial policy is in America and the willingness and demands to spend in energy supply chain. A couple of fun facts that, I, that, I, that help me get comfortable with this. We've been in this era of globalization our whole lives. And now with war at 80 year highs in, across the world and growing discontent with China in America, separation in some degree is going to happen. It's just very hard to do. Critical industries, EVs, batteries, renewables. We import most of those critical inputs for those. And as an example, 40% of copper is imported into America. That's necessary for AI. The other one, which is, I think, wildly misappreciated, about half of all large cell batteries are imported to America. And you know where from? From China. So separation is very hard. And I think it's why you're getting bipartisan support for this separation. And you're going to need a ton of CapEx to do that separation. So when you use that phrase bipartisan, it makes me think that we're on this trajectory regardless of what happens in November. Is that how you feel about it? Yeah, that's what we think. That, well, if you look back, we've seen both of these presidents before. President Trump favored tariffs early on. President Biden has favored subsidies, incentive-based spending, but recently is announcing tariffs. I know they're small, 18 billion from President Biden. I know it. But it's showing you where this separation is necessary. Again, it's EVs, solar cells, batteries, critical inputs. So it looks like both parties are going to use both tools to get this security that America needs. The thing, though, is that takes time to ramp up. Without question. So what happens when we have this political rhetoric that is extremely hawkish China on both sides taking action maybe sooner than the industry can meet the demand? Um, political rhetoric aside, when you're having demand and supply mismatches, prices will go up. And if I can invest alongside a, a government or even incentivize private businesses that will spend, regardless of, say, where interest rates are or where the economy is, I want to play, play with that. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also the, la like the last point to round out is this is what people don't have exposure to. It supports the broadening trade. Uh, and it, it's an industrial policy initiative that really we haven't invested alongside for 15, maybe even 20 years. Well, in this market, I mean, stock bond correlations have been confusing at best, but it has, <laughs> the traditional is yields higher. It's a problem for equity markets because you have to discount future cash flows. In this scenario where yields are going higher because there is more spending, the higher deficit, maybe more inflation, is what you're telling me that that's a positive for this market? Um, I think there's just time horizons that are different for that. As you mentioned, industrial policy spend is going to take a really long time. Interest rates have reset. We went through that period where we had to discount those cash flows. It looks like the Fed is going to cut rates amid this cyclical slowdown. Uh, no disagreement on what the market price is from us. But over the longer term, I think the way this plays out is it's very unlikely we go back to interest rates that we had post the global financial crisis. And What's normal? What do you think normal is? Three, three and a half. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think that there's a huge conviction on Wall Street about that but it is wildly different than what we have experienced. And to your point, the playbook should be different about how you invest. If you go back to the global financial crisis, it's a decade we all sat here and talked about it, but all you had to do was lever tech. That's all you had to do. It sounds easy now. It, it does, but if you, the point to say it this, that way is that I think a lot of people have that position still on. They have a lot of cash and they have a lot of tech. Is it possible we're in a higher interest rate environment that has industrial policy spend behind it and we should rotate a little bit? Yeah. At the expense of tech? For my clients so far, they're not willing to do that. Um, many of them have too much exposure, but we really do believe in the AI trade. We do think that's going to work. We just want them to broaden out their exposure to that trade beyond just the four stocks that everybody owns. It's just getting more exposure. And with higher interest rates, I can diversify, similar returns, less risk. That's the game. Let's talk about traps and finish there. Value traps. You can look at some of the regionals, and it's clear that they trade at these levels for a reason. Yeah. They're there for a reason over the last 12 months. Are you cautioning investors about what they're buying in this everything else trade? Absolutely. They're what are you telling them not to buy? Low earning, negative earning companies. If you're not going to have the world, the single factor that has defined the post, um, post COVID equity experience is high quality versus low quality, high profitability, low profitability. If we don't go back to a zero interest rate environment, that factor should be most important. And this type of dispersion is all across the show every day. Equity markets, wide dispersion, large cap, small cap, credit markets, real estate, everywhere. So just stay high quality is still the thing you need to do regardless of 
um, what you think interest rates will be. I think that's still going to be the defining factor. Got it. Tom, it's good to see you. Tom Kennedy of JP Morgan. Thank you, sir. Equity futures on the S&P firmer here by a tenth of 1%. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Former Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan saying it's likely the central bank will cut rates in September amid progress on inflation. However, he added the move isn't likely to mark the beginning of a full-fledged rate cut cycle. Kaplan speaking after a number of Fed officials led by Chair Jerome Powell noted in recent weeks that the central bank is making some progress toward lowering inflation to its 2% goal. Warner Brothers Discovery shares up in the pre-market. The Financial Times reporting the media giant is considering splitting its studio, its streaming and studio businesses from its legacy television networks. CEO David Saslov is weighing options including asset sales and spinning out the Warner Brothers movie studio and Max Streaming into a new company and free of the broader group's $39 billion debt load. The FT saying representatives were not immediately available for comment. And chipmaker TSMC also higher in the pre-market, boosting its revenue outlook after quarterly results beat estimates. The supplier to NVIDIA and Apple expects sales to grow even more than the mid-20% range it had previously projected, as it rides a strong wave of chip demand. TSMC results coming after semiconductor stocks were punished yesterday due to concerns about tighter U.S. restrictions on chip sales to China. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. More from Yahara in about 30 minutes' time. I don't know about you, but I just want to cover the Ken Griffin $45 million Stegosaurus fossil story once again, don't you? It angers me because he's not even keeping it. He's putting it in a museum, which I know is the right thing to do, but why even buy a dinosaur if you're not going to hold on to it's it? It's the kind of thing that my nephew would ask me to buy if I had that kind of money. You know, <laughs> and would you buy do it a if dinosaur? You had that kind of money? Absolutely. My nephew, anything. You're good on Up next on the program, the dam is breaking. It's not unreasonable for people to say, wait a minute. They're 81 years old. And so I think it's a legitimate thing from the race. A conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500 firmer here by a little more than a tenth of 1%. No drama, nothing like the price action of yesterday. Yields are higher by two or three basis points. The 10-year, 418.46. Under surveillance this morning, the dam is breaking. Would you be willing to even look at the idea that if you get in, perhaps in a year and a half or two, you would look to your, in your words, very capable vice president to, to carry it over the finish line? Well, look, only if... I was told that there was some medical condition that I had. It's not unreasonable for people to say, wait a minute, they're 81 years old. And so I think it's a legitimate thing from the race. That's a shift from the President of the United States. Here's the latest. Top Democrats ramping up calls for President Biden to step aside. ABC News reporting that congressional leaders Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries have warned Biden that if he stays in, he ruins the party's down ballot chances. And CNN reporting former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi telling Biden that recent polling shows he can't win in November. And rejoins us now from the RNC. AMH, the pressure's building. Absolutely. And Jonathan, this is political isolation that the president is starting to feel with those three names you mentioned, Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, very close to the president, all of them basically saying you are going to ruse the, ruin the chances of down ballot Democrats if we want to maintain any control in this government. And also, Jonathan, not just political isolation, self-isolation from COVID-19. The president had to skip an event last night uh, in Nevada. He is trying to go to these swing states. He is trying to campaign. And now he's in Delaware and he's self-isolating because of that positive COVID test. I would look ahead to see what does the rest of the week bring for the president? Who is he going to be speaking to? Is now the time potentially he has a serious conversation with his family ahead of the RNC, uh, DNC in August? Here at the RNC, it is not isolation. 
It is a Republican Party that they are trying to put on a face, even though under the surface there's a lot of divisions. They are trying to put on a face, one that is united. It feels like this is an exiled king. He's come back. He's literally, not figuratively, dodged a bullet over the weekend. And this evening, they're going to crown him. Amory, on the latest at the Republican convention, ahead of that address from the former president, Donald Trump. Joining us now is Tobin Marcus of Wolf Research. Tobin, the threshold for the sitting president to drop out of the race has shifted. Initially, it was about the Lord Almighty coming down and telling him to go. Not going to happen. The next one was someone coming to him from his team and saying, you can't win. It sounds like Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House, has done so. The new one is if someone tells me I have a condition, I would step aside. It's reasonable to ask these questions. Tobin, what do you make of that shift, that pivot almost, over the last few weeks? Yeah, Pelosi, I suppose, is not uh, not that far from the Lord Almighty in terms of uh, the, the way that these things are going within the Democratic Party. I mean, certainly there has been a shift. The uh, building of pressure has been uh, a little bit nonlinear. It's been kind of hard to follow this story. He seemed to uh, quell some of the Democratic doubts or at least, you know, bluff Democrats back into line at various points. Uh, and we had thought over the weekend that the assassination on, attempt on Trump might kind of suck the oxygen out of this effort. But the leaks over the past 24 hours from Schumer and Jeffries, which they pointedly did not really uh, deny once those reports uh, came to light, quite likely with some uh, linkage from their own offices, um, you know, suggested that conversation had gotten farther and they'd been more explicit with Biden even before the assassination attempt uh, than had been known at the time. Kind of gave him a couple of days grace uh, to let that story clear and now have, have renewed the pressure. So and it looks untenable. It, the question is sort of how long he uh, he holds out since ultimately he still does kind of have to make the decision himself. Uh, but it's it's sort of hard to see a way out for him at this point. Can you establish a base case, Tobin? And if I was a client, I'm sure you get this question all the time. If he steps aside and Kamala Harris steps in, I want to understand what the platform looks like. Is the policy much different? Any different at all? I really don't think it is. You know, the the determinants of policy are not going to be the preferences of a Democratic president, even if uh, even if Harris were to win. You know, within the administration, there already has been uh, essentially a coalitional arrangement between mainstream Democrats and progressives through the first four years of the Biden administration so far, where we've seen, you know, quite progressive appointees in charge of a lot of the key regulatory posts, antitrust, financial regulation. Um, some other big ones. Uh, and then from a, a legislative outcome perspective, they're likely looking at divided government, in which case everything needs to be bipartisan compromises. And even in the absolute ceiling case for Democrats, where they managed to hold on to 50 seats in the Senate, at that point, the determinant is, you know, what does John Tester of Montana want to do rather than what does Kamala Harris want to do? Uh, so I, I don't think that the delta between them is really going to make any difference from a policy perspective. Tobin, when it comes to policy, though, one of the more remarkable things of this debate over Biden, the people that have come to his assistance have been the more progressive wing. It's been Bernie Sanders. It's been AOC. And we have seen some of the policy coming out of the Biden administration, though it's unlikely to pass at this point, are things like Supreme Court reform, camping, capping rents and rent increases. Does that represent a shift to the left, that the Democratic Party sees the road ahead and says, unless we go left, we cannot win this thing? So I wouldn't say that the Democratic Party has made that assessment, but it does look as if President Biden and the Biden campaign uh, have made it a near term assessment that, you know, leaning left, putting out some new uh, policy that might plausibly appeal to the progressive wing of the party is a good way to shore up support with the, you know, the Sanders and AOCs of the world. Um, so I don't think that's a coincidence that you see them, you know, standing relatively strong at the same time that he's rolling out these new kind of long shot progressive policy proposals. I certainly agree with your assessment that uh, realistically, the composition of Congress is going to preclude uh, actually taking action on uh, on hardly any of that. But yeah, I mean, that that looks like a, a gambit by the Biden campaign rather than a sort of a durable ship by the party as a whole. Well, on the other side of things, you have J.D. Vance speaking yesterday for the first time as the presumptive VP nominee, saying these things, Tobin. We won't cater to Wall Street, calling them Wall Street barons who crashed the economy. This is a party that not too long ago, you finally had some of these Wall Street figures turn around and start to support Trump. I'm thinking of Schwartzman from Blackstone. I'm thinking of Ken Griffin, who've talked about donating. We don't know whether they actually have. Does this change things for the support of Wall Street and Trump and his VP pick? I doubt it. Certainly they wanted Trump to go in a different direction with his VP pick. They, the Vance was not the uh, preferred uh, nominee of that you know, set of, of influential donors. Um, but he does stand apart from the Republican Party on a lot of these issues. And I tend to think that he's not going to get his way on a more populist approach to antitrust or a more populist approach 
to financial regulation, even in terms of Vance's own positions, his bark has been uh, somewhat worse than his bite on some of these issues. You know, uh, taking financial regulation, for example, you know, he's had some sort of strange bedfellow uh, legislative efforts where he co-sponsored uh, executive compensation reforms with Elizabeth Warren, for example. But when it comes to some of the highest profile, most you know, genuinely material issues for the sector, like the Basel III in-game rules, he's been uh, in lockstep in, in opposition to those with industry and with most of the rest of the party. You know, this is someone who has a very sort of reliable voting record uh, with the Republican Party as a whole in good standing with the kind of official conservative movement organs, despite the fact that uh, from a rhetorical perspective, he's taken some of these, um, you know, populist divergences from the pro-business Republican platform. So, um, you know, I, I would not read the uh, argument that he's trying to make to working class voters to mean that the Republican Party as a whole is not going to deliver uh, policy that lines up with some of what industry wants. That's certainly a big question at the moment on Wall Street, Tobin, as you know. That's one to watch. Tobin, great to catch up with you, sir. Tobin Marcus there of Wolf Research. We'll get back to the financials a little bit later. Chris Harvey, Wells Fargo, upgrading the banks. We'll catch up with Chris in about 35 minutes' time. Coming up next on the programme, TSMC raising its revenue outlook amid the AI boom. That stock is bouncing back by 1.2% from New York. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Just a little bit of calm relative to the storm of yesterday, if you want to call it that. We're pulling back yesterday from all-time highs on the S&P 500. This morning, we're firmer by a tenth of 1%. The Nasdaq 100 bouncing back by about a third of 1%. Difficult run for the Nasdaq 100. Worst day since December 22 in yesterday's session. Small caps a little bit lighter, softer down, negative by a quarter of 1% on the session. If you get to the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, shaping up as follows. I want to sit at the front end of the curve just for a moment. We're up two basis points on a two-year to 446. Jobless claims, Danny, about an hour away. Jobless claims were better than expected last week. We need a repeat of that this week because it wasn't just CPI that encouraged some of this trade. It was the fact that the labor market showed signs of holding up. Yeah, exactly. It's that, you know, soft landing that you're not going to have non-linear type raises in unemployment at this point. And it's something that powered the entirety of this market. It's something that also powered small caps too, that you could have inflation coming in, but the economy not showing more issue. Of course, where the real stress is starting to show up is in duration, is in the long end. But you have a contradiction. You have concerns about the deficit, but you have a 20-year auction where everybody is willing to buy. Let's turn the page and talk about another contradiction, a point of tension in the FX market. We talked about this yesterday. You've got an administration potentially getting a second term, talking about higher tariffs, but also calling a stronger dollar a problem. Jay Pulaski was sat in your chair, and I'm sure you heard some of this in the last hour from TPW. I had tons of feedback on some of his comments, and they were taking a very different view of what he was saying. Jay thinks that the US exception that we've seen dominate global markets for much of the last 10 years, the last decade, could be undermined, damaged, destroyed even, by an incoming Trump administration with the policies they've been talking about on the campaign trail. What did you think of that? I really wish I was around the table for that moment. Because, I, look, I think he makes some great points. My question for him would have been, this is going to be a government that spends a lot. I think we, we can all agree that. And if we look back to COVID, the reason we had American exceptionalism is because it was a government that spent a lot. So the question is, how dam much damage can you really do to the American economy if you're running such a high deficit? Because history would show us not a lot. How hot is this economy going to be? It's going to be all about how willing international investors are to fund that deficit and what price you've got to pay in the bond market. We'll keep revisiting all of this. Under surveillance this morning, our top story, President Biden facing mounting pressure from within his own party to drop out of the race. ABC News reporting congressional leaders Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, have told Biden it might be best for him to step aside. The president taking a break from the campaign trail after testing positive for COVID. If that wasn't bad enough for him yesterday, the hits just kept coming throughout the afternoon. One after another, first Adam Schiff publicly to the LA Times, and then you have ABC News, CNN, you have Semaphore, all of these different outlets reporting people behind the scenes. I think it was interesting Pelosi went to him and basically said, don't not drop out, but said, look at these polls. Not only are you at risk, but all the Democrats down ballot. And if you don't make a decision soon, they're going to get public about it. And that to me is significant because he not that long ago said it was the polls showing him that he could drop out is the reason he would do it. But also in CNN's reporting, they said 
he basically said to Pelosi, well, look at the polls I got. I have polls that show I'm winning. I, I find this so frustrating, John, this, this picking and choosing and this reliance on polls. When President Biden knows better than anyone the value and the importance of momentum and how much bad momentum really impacts you. Yeah, there's not much momentum right now. And that infighting in that party continues. I want to talk about some of the damage we did yesterday to Taiwan Semi. That stock was down and down quite hard. It's bouncing back just a little bit in the pre-market on the U.S. depository. We're up by about one full percentage point in the pre-market. The numbers, they're putting up the numbers. I think we keep coming back to this, Danny. Listen to this. They're predicting sales will grow more than the mid-20 percentage point guidance they'd offered last time around. And they're looking for the AI spending boom to continue. It's well, hard to fight this. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to fight it, but the issue, and I mean, th this is so nitpicky, is the fact that, yeah, they're all growing a huge amount, but it's like a little bit less than they were before. So, okay, example, NVIDIA reports earnings last quarter. They report over 400% earnings growth. This time the expectation is a mere doubling. It's a mere 100. So I think that gives people the space to be like, you know what, maybe we take a pause on this thing, especially if we're thinking about geopolitics, because yeah, the growth is strong, but that rate of growth is slowing. Yeah, and the geopolitics is certainly a headwind at the moment, that's for sure. The ECB decision is about 40 or so minutes away. We'll get that rate decision, then 30 minutes later, you get a news conference with President Chris Christine Lagarde expected them to keep rates unchanged after cutting them last time around. That next move could come in September. We had Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen talking up the prospect of a super September. More on that a little bit later. The euro at the moment, 109.29, a bit weaker on the session, down by a tenth of 1%. Let's turn to this conversation, one you do not want to miss. The UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, making her first visit to London since being appointed earlier this month. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix sat down with Reeves earlier this morning and asked her about today's announcement of a fiscal lock in and why she thinks she needed to do that. We've introduced to Parliament today the Budget Responsibility Bill that was first announced in the King's speech just yesterday. And the purpose of this bill is to provide the, the fiscal lock so that never again can a Prime Minister or a Chancellor uh, do what Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng did with their disastrous uh, mini-budget just under two years ago. So this will mean that the Office of Budget Responsibility, the independent office, uh, can always provide a forecast when there are significant and permanent tax and spending changes, uh, specifically worth more than 1% of GDP. Uh, that would have meant it would have triggered an OBR uh, forecast uh, back when Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng introduced that disastrous mini-budget. And so that, I guess, is, is something that investors will, you know, take solace to. Uh, you've announced a lot. The Prime Minister said that you will achieve that 2.5% target. Are you confident that's achievable? So the purpose of today really was to give businesses, give investors that confidence that Britain is a, a stable place to invest and do business. I'm determined to do that. We were elected two weeks ago on a mandate to grow our economy based on that stability that is so essential to underpin any economic decision making. And so that's why this bill is so important. Now, look, I'm under no illusions about the scale of the challenge that I face in this job. There are going to be difficult decisions uh, ahead. Uh, but I was really clear during the election that everything that we put forward, whether that is on the NHS or on defence or on tax policy, will always be fully costed and fully funded. That's very different to what we've had these last 14 years. Uh, with decisions with no regard to where the money's going to come from. And I'm going to be different. And, and Chancellor, I mean, a lot, of course, of what you're trying to put in place will depend on private capital coming into the UK. Have you had discussions with institutions, investors, even pension funds of their willingness to come to the UK? You're absolutely right that our plans to grow the economy depend on businesses and investors choosing Britain as a place to invest. And I want investors to look at Britain and see a country that's got a stable government with a clear mandate to grow the economy and chooses Britain as a stable place to invest in an increasingly volatile and uncertain uh, world, which is why the fiscal lock today is so important. But also the other changes we've announced in the last two weeks. We have announced more policies to grow the economy than the last government did in 14 years. In the first 72 hours in the job, I made more comprehensive changes to the UK planning system than the previous government did in more than a decade because I know that we need 
to unlock that private investment that businesses tell me they are ready to invest if we get rid of some of those blockages. And the blockages in the planning system, I think, are more significant than anything else. And so those changes to bring back mandatory housing yeah. targets for local authorities, ending the moratorium on onshore wind, calling in planning decisions on data centres and on housing, really crucial both to send a signal to business that Britain is a place to invest but also to make sure that we can get on with things and get building in Britain again. And are they listening? Have you gotten calls from big investors saying yes that, that's a plan that I wanted to see and I'm in? Absolutely. So in my first uh, speech at the Treasury uh, a week and a half ago, uh, we had businesses, we had investors in the audience met afterwards. The following day, uh, we announced the creation of a national wealth fund, uh, work led by Mark Carney, the task force led by Mark Carney uh, for the Labour Party when we were in opposition, now reporting to a Labour government. And on that wealth fund task force, we also had Amanda Blank from Aviva, Venkat from Barclays, Antonio from LNG and other big UK investors. And that is absolutely crucial because there's no plans that I can draw up in my new office in the Treasury that are going to work unless we have business buy-in. And I hope that businesses saw in Labour's manifesto and also in the plans that we've announced in government have the fingerprints of business all over them because these plans have been co-written with business because they're all about unlocking private sector investment into our economy. Um, Chancellor, are you considering tax breaks to either boost pension savings or make UK investments more attractive? I'm not going to announce any tax breaks or tax changes uh, w without saying where the money is going to come from. And we will have a budget uh, later this year. But I also just need to be really clear and honest about the scale of the challenge uh, that we have inherited with the public finances. Um, we're going to have to make difficult decisions. We need to fix the foundations before we can start rebuilding things in uh, Britain. But unlike the previous government, I am going to be honest about the scale of the challenge. I'm going to level uh, with people and, and together we're going to rebuild our country based on that private sector business investment to get our economy growing because it, I asked the Treasury officials to uh, give me an assessment of how much stronger the UK economy would be today if we'd have grown at just the average rate of OECD economies these last 14 years. And the answer is we'd be £140 billion pounds bigger today, worth £5,000 for every family in Britain. We have got to grow our economy. It's the only way to improve living standards, keep taxes low and have the money that we need for our dilapidated public services. Just a fantastic exchange between Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua speaking with the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves there. It's amazing how we're still reflecting on what happened with Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. We talk of Germany having a debt break. It feels like the whole continent have this self-imposed debt break now following the difficulties the Truss had and Kwarteng with the bond market. You can even see those echoes of Liz Truss in the King's speech where one of the things that they introduced was giving the Office of Budget Responsibility more power, kind of to say, hey, we don't want to do the same thing that happened with Liz Truss. But you can hear in Rachel Reeves' really careful language. Any type of spending she talks about, she's really hesitant to talk about it, talk about tax cuts, because, again, she doesn't want to upset this bond market, you really get that feeling that she's being so careful. Fiscal discipline, rolling out the red carpet for private capital. It's early days, but at the moment, that, just that alone, that sounded like a Conservative Chancellor, didn't it, to you? It did, absolutely. This is not Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party anymore. Not at all. So far from it. The fact that they want private investment to whip up growth, again, that's not something you'd usually hear from Labour. And I keep saying it's early days. I think we've got to wait to see what tax policy really looks like before we can make definitive conclusions about what kind of leadership we're going to see here. That story, available to you on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. Watch that full interview with Francine and the Chancellor of the Exchequer online and on the Bloomberg Terminal. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Shares of Domino's Pizza falling in the pre-market after second quarter sales fell short of estimates. The company's results showing that discounts and new product launches have not been enough to attract value-seeking diners. The restaurant chain is also suspending its long-term guidance of adding 1,100 Global Net stores annually. United Airlines reporting that third quarter profit will fall short of Wall Street estimates. The airline saying adjusted earnings will be up to $3.25 a share in the current period. That's less than the average $3.38 analysts were expecting. United echoing rival Delta saying that low-cost carriers 
are slashing prices as they, as they try to fill excess seats this summer, and they say that is weighing on the entire industry. And Boeing's largest union voting to authorize a potential strike as contract talks enter a crucial phase. The International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, which represents about 32,000 Boeing mechanics in Washington and Oregon, took over the Seattle Mariners ballpark on Wednesday in a move intended to showcase union solidarity. The union saying in a statement that its largely symbolic vote to strike passed with 99.9% .9 support. The current contract is set to expire on September 13th, and the union will vote again once Boeing makes its final offer. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Uh, Yahira, thank you. More from Yahira in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, betting on September. I think whatever happens, the Fed is planning and gearing up to cut rates in September. It won't move in July, but they'll move in September. We'll talk about September up next on the program, live from New York. You're watching Bloomberg Surveillance. about 30 minutes, an ECB rate decision, 15 minutes after that, jobless claims, and then 15 minutes after that, a news conference with ECB President Christine Lagarde. That's about 60 minutes away, so that's quite an hour coming up for you. Equity futures at the moment, firmer by a tenth of 1%. The euro a little weaker, 109.29. Under surveillance this morning, betting on September. I think whatever happens, the Fed is planning and gearing up to cut rates in September. It won't move in July, but they'll move in September. The Fed, though, it, it, its path, I think, for September is pretty clear. I think there's a good chance they could do one more cut in December. If new policies come out, it'll take some time for them to digest those, and that may affect uh, their next decisions. It's a difficult one. Here's the latest. Investors gearing up for another busy day of Fed speak as a growing chorus of officials signal they're moving closer to cutting interest rates. So Bantra Japra of Sokgen writing this. While recent data is supportive of rate cuts sooner than we anticipated, the market might be getting ahead of itself, pricing more than three cuts by January and nearly six cuts by the middle of 2025. Sabatra's with us for more. Sabatra, good morning. Good morning. The official house call at Sockgen was no cuts yep. this year. It feels like September might happen. Before we get there, I want to talk about the bigger view mm -hmm. from you and the team. Challenging really this view that once you start, they keep going. What's the pushback to that? Uh, the fact that the data has been relatively strong, right? It's, uh, it's something that the Fed has to kind of recalibrate as we go along. If you listen to what, uh, uh, you know, Fed Chair Williams, I'm sorry, um, Williams, uh, the New York Fed president said, he basically said that, um, you know, that they're trying to move into less restrictive policy. Um, so they're not really talking about embarking on a very aggressive path of rate cuts or even any sort of a, a, a you know, a cadence of once a meeting or once a quarter. So they're going to be very, very data dependent once they start. So, you know, kind of drawing the analogy with the ECB, they cut rates in June and, and Sakchin rightfully called it a data independent uh, rate cut. Uh, so, you know, again, coming into the end of the year, they're going to be faced with uh, questions about unit labor costs and how the data is progressing. So it's not certain to us that, that the ECB is going to be cutting every meeting. So the Fed might very well be in the same situation where they're going to have to recalibrate as we go along as they move away from, from restrictive policy. There might be something else they need to consider as well. Uh, and Robert Kaplan talked about it. If you're a current Fed official, you won't touch this subject. Former Fed officials can dance around it a little bit more, I guess. If new policies come out, it will take some time for them to digest those, and that may affect their next decisions. How important is November as a date for how you think about 2025? So the November elections, I think, are very, very meaningful. Um, I think that after they, they cut in September, it'll be interesting to see uh, how they message uh, their policy path from there on. Um, you know, the market, I think, is, is aggressively pricing in for several cuts between, uh, between now and January. That feels like it's a little bit too much. Uh, but really, the outcome of the elections, I think, are going to be very key on how they, they think about policy uh, after uh, November. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the Trump administration is talking about um, you know, higher tariffs. Um, you know, the debt and deficits picture is something that they're going to be very focused on. 
uh, as well. So, um, you know, it's something that uh, the, pal the, the, um, the, uh, the Fed is going to have to pay more attention to is not just the monetary side, but also the general trajectory for, for, the, for the fiscal side of things. You know, it's interesting because both the ECB and the Fed have had calls of being political, different flavors. For the ECB, it's that by cutting, you're acting as a kingmaker. You're letting these governments come in, run really high deficits. And again, you're saving them by cutting. If we're in a position where in November we get a Trump presidency, and we know that's going to be the policy, we know the deficit's going to be higher, and the Fed is still cutting, is that a problem? Are they doing the same thing that's accused of the, that the ECB is being accused of doing? So, you know, the, the trajectory for debt and deficits is, is, uh, is quite dire. Um, regardless of who gets elected, whether it's, it's Trump or Biden, I think that that's something that the next administration is going to have to address. So it's not really the, the purvey of one, uh, you know, uh, party or the other. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that's why I think it makes it very tricky for the Fed uh, to be able to cut rates, um, you know, in an environment where uh, debt and deficits are and, and long end yields could potentially rise if the market and the bond vigilantes start to uh, kind of push back on the, the narrative that's coming, uh, coming put forth by the administrations that come to power. Um, so I think that they're going to be very, very careful about uh, policy uh, adjustments. Uh, it's going to be more about moving away from restrictive policy as opposed to embarking on uh, several rate cuts. I mean, the last leg of inflation is going to be kind of tricky. Again, you, you're talking about, uh, you know, inflation getting from 3% to 2%. That pathway is probably going to be a lot slower than people anticipate. So the first rate cuts, um, you know, will kind of signal that they're willing to do more. But whether they deliver on that really depends on the data. Th that idea that you mentioned, that the bond vi vigilantes are going to come in if there's government spending that they don't like. To your point, we already know there's going to be a lot of spending. And with that backdrop, sure, there's been some curve steepeners, but we still get a 20-year auction yesterday that's absorbed really well. There's clearly still demand for duration. So how big of a risk do you actually think that is, that at some point this bond market might try to punish too much spending from the government? So at an environment where the data is starting to weaken, you are going to see uh, the market um, rallying and, and bond yields coming down. Uh, if anything, I'd say in the last you know, three to four weeks, what we have seen is the market kind of getting ahead of itself, pricing in the Trump trade, the uh, 530 part of the curve steepening out quite meaningfully. And in the last week, I'd say there's, there's, there's been a little bit of a, a rethink and profit taking on those trades. And as the market positions for rate cuts, you're going to see that decline in yields heading into the elections. This has been our call all along is that 10 year yields will start to decline. We'll get 10 year yields around 4%. Uh, by uh, the elections or at the end of the year. And then after that is when you'll start seeing uh, the, the sell-off led by the back end because of, of debt and deficits. There's really not any uh, willingness on either party to really um, address the debt and deficit issues. And there's not really that much room, I would argue, uh, for, uh, you know, for cuts in spending. Um, so it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the next administration deals with the issues on, on debt and deficits and how much the bond market is going to push back on, on that narrative. That's an important phrase, debt and deficits. So let me get this right. You're running into November, you sell off coming out of November. We've been trying to work out if we get high yields, is it because of a better growth profile, higher inflation or because of supply? Do you think it's just about supply or do we get a higher bump of inflation as well? Do we get higher interest rates from the Federal Reserve too? How do you think about those other parts of this? So I think it's going to be a combination of, of factors, John. And I think you're right to point out that part of that could be because of the stimulative effects you're getting from, from rate cuts. So if the market starts to look towards, uh, you know, especially at a time when the economy is relatively strong, this is a very unusual cycle. At least in my career, I haven't seen one where the Fed is cutting rates to, to get policy out of restrictive territory and not cutting rates because we're heading into, you know, some sort of a crisis or a meaningful recession. So in that sort of context, they have to be very, very careful. If they cut too aggressively, that could again lead to froth in the market. We've already seen an easing of financial conditions. You know, if you look at the equity market, it's, it's extraordinarily, uh, you know, it's performing really well. Credit spreads are very, very tight. So you're looking, and the dollar is very strong. So all of these uh, metrics lead us to believe that financial conditions are easy. So they have to be careful about cutting and not causing financial conditions to ease further. And if that would happen, and if growth actually starts to pick up, and we see uh, see what we saw 
in the first month of the year, or first few months of the year, you could actually see uh, you know, yields rise. It's super unfair to ask for a number, but I've got to ask for a number. So we rallied down to 4% on 10s. What do we sell off to? Are we threatening five again on a 10 year in America? Um, probably, at least our, our forecasts are for 10 year yields getting back towards 4.5% by the middle of, of next year. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the uh, policies put forth by the, uh, the administration to come is going to dictate how much of a, of a sell-off we see. Um, and it also depends on, tra on the trajectory for, for the economy. So a modest sell-off from here on makes sense for us to get from 45 to 5%. You're going to really need to see a, a per perhaps a further deterioration in the outlook for fiscal policy. Sabatra, super thoughtful. It's good to see you. Thank you. Sabatra Japa there of Sokgen on the future of this bond market. Debt and deficits, important for treasuries. Yes, but I think the fascinating part of it is, this isn't my own phrase, I'm going to steal it from Mark McCormick, is that this market is a serial monogamist. It can only concentrate on one thing at a time. So it's interesting to hear that for now, the trajectory is yields lower, because all we can concentrate is on the Fed. But come November, come next year, that's when things change. You can just feel the pull of politics every single morning at the moment, after the last couple of weeks, ever since that debate. We said the following day, the following few days after that debate between Biden and Trump, it felt like it was the first trading day of the campaign for 2024. And that's what it turned out to be. Coming up on this program, we'll catch up with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo, Jeff Yu of BMY, Robert Socken of City. He thinks we get a recession in the US this year. And Alberto Gallo of Andromeda Capital. A lot still to come with ECB and jobless claims on deck. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. is well ahead of the Fed. This is clearly what's propelled a lot of the small cap optimism. These are the other groups that are going to benefit from interest rates starting to move lower again. And investors are going to see there's going to be an opportunity there. The Fed does not have to deliver those cuts. It just has to get the market thinking, hey, the Fed's moving that direction. It's not just inflation that's driving cuts now. It's the broader economy that the Fed is watching. That cash on the sideline that gets put to work in a world where all of these uncertainties of rates, inflation, and recession start to shrink. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. And this third hour looks a little something like this. In about 15 minutes' time, we get an ECB rate decision. After that, a big data point, jobless claims. Following that, we'll hear from President Christine Lagarde of the ECB. For that estimate at 8.30 Eastern time, the number 229. That's in our survey, the median estimate, 229,000 for jobless claims. The previous number, 222. Can we settle in, settle down in and around the 220s? And it's also significant for the Fed speak that we've most recently heard. Waller was out yesterday saying that one of his big concerns for the first time is unemployment, that you get some serious move in it. Sounds a lot like daily, and that seems to be the justification for some of these doves, that the two-sided risk has come back. What happens when the numbers are strong and the trend is different than we thought? We've heard it repeatedly over the last few days. We're getting closer, but we're not there yet. The Federal Reserve inching towards a rate cut in September. The price action on the S&P 500 looks a little something like this. We're firmer by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, Treasury yields climbing just a little bit by a basis point or two to 4.1788. Lots of thoughts on foreign exchange. It's been overwhelming the last 24 hours. Donald Trump telling Business Week we've got a big currency problem. What can they do about it? Jay Pulaski of TPW joining this program earlier this morning. Danny, he's saying they won't even have to try. Based on the campaign, Pain, he thinks this dollar is going to weaken a lot if they get back into power. I, I just wonder what the bigger, obviously there are a lot of consequences of that, but just if you're trying to put a portfolio together, what the consequences of that are. I was thinking about yesterday, it's, you know, a classic risk off day. You get high beta selling off, basically everything selling off. And where do you look for safety? The bond market basically did nothing. And by all accounts, maybe it will be selling off because of high deficit. The dollar can't help you. And then, oh yeah, big cap tech is really overvalued, so that can't help you either. The options for hiding in this market are starting to look a little bit thin. Long Bitcoin, short Meta. That's the <laughs> ultimate Trump trade. Bitcoin and all the Bitcoin crypto bro support he's receiving. Meta, how many times have they thrown mud at Meta? 
Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, in this campaign over the last few months. To the point where Trump told Business Week that he wouldn't have TikTok banned because it would benefit Meta because everybody goes there. But John, I don't, people didn't feel uncomfortable going long in video. I don't know how comfortable they're going to feel about Bitcoin being their trade. Just to be very clear, that's <laughs> not my trade, not a trade recommendation. Chris Harvey makes those. He's joining us in just a second. I'm not saying he made that one either. You get the picture. Coming up, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo on the Trump trade, just not that piece of it. Jeff Yu of BNY reacting to the ECB rate decision and Rob Sarkin of City on why he's expecting a recession this year. We begin with the big issue. It's the Trump trade. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo saying this, what looked like a pop last week has indeed become a rotation driven by Trump's polling and policies. We are confident regulatory pressure has crested and we upgrade banks to outperform. Chris joins us for more. Chris, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, This too. is a change for you in a short amount of time as well. It, it is a change, right? We didn't expect what happened this weekend to happen. And what that did, it made the probability of Trump um, taking the presidency um, from likely to highly likely. And then suddenly, we weren't talking about the fun fundamentals anymore. We were talking about policies. We were talking about tariffs. We were talking about taxes. We were talking about regulation. And, and when you talk to people, and I'm sure you, you've had lots of conversations, you, get, you have 10 different, um, 10 different conversations, you get 10 different answers. Rates are going higher, rates are going lower, the curve's gonna steepen, the curve's gonna invert, uh, we're gonna have inflation, we're not gonna have inflation. The only thing that we're confident in is that we've crested on the regulatory side, right? It was already occurring with, with some of the things with Basel III, it was occurring with Chevron, but now that it looks like the Trump, Trump administration is going back in, it is something that we think is long and exploitable, which was a catalyst we needed to upgrade banks. How broad is this bank's core? Is it large caps and regional is one it, or the other? It, it's, it's starting with large cap, but really we like the banks, we like the financial space, and the regulation is going to help the group across the board. It's gonna help multiples, right? Ultimately, I think it's gonna help earnings as well, but the issue is that it's multiples and you can start to price that in, and it's already beginning. We can talk as much as we want about trade and tariff, but the regulatory environment is already changing. So having a vice presidential candidate who talks about Wall Street barons saying yeah. he won't cater to Wall Street, do you just write that off as campaign rhetoric? Um, I, I, I wouldn't, no, I, I wouldn't write that off as campaign rhetoric, right? There's going to be a lot of push and there's gonna be a lot of pull. Um, J.D. Vance is, is new to the platform and, and so there's gonna be some, I think there's also gonna be some growing pains and, and he has very, some very strong opinions. Um, I, I don't, I don't dismiss that, right? But what they talk about and what I think is going to come through and is coming through is it's America first, right? And so it's domestic companies over global companies. There's a talk about being pro-cyclical and so it, it's more about economically sensitive names, at least in the short term, th than your growth names. And also with the regulation, it's more about the capital markets, whether it's companies with M&A or IPOs or just multiple revaluation across the, the financial and banking space. In, in, in that trade of American companies right. versus abroad, it, full on display yesterday right. where you get the TSMCs of the world, those chip makers abroad yeah. falling, and Intel does fine. It kind of yeah. trades water. Does that kind of rally have legs? Um, I, so yesterday was a really interesting one because you're right, everything went down. And so there wasn't a whole lot of discrimination. And if you look across tech, there's certain tech more so on the hardware semi side that you would punish or, or weigh on a little bit more than you would on the services and software side, but everything went down. And I think it's just gonna take a while for the market to really discriminate. And the other thing is, we're going, we saw this last time, we're gonna have a number of iterations. There's gonna be a number of things out in the public that we talk about. It's gonna be 10%, it's gonna be these companies, it's gonna be that com uh, this industry, and it's gonna change over time, and the market's reacting. But what the market is saying is, hey, we went from a likely um, change in administrations to a highly likely change in administration. A and the views here are much different, so we need to price those in. Just to get a bit of nuance for you, from you and pin you down a little bit, yeah. what is the difference between sort of this traditional rotation and a pure Trump trade? What's the difference yeah. between the two? So uh, traditional rotation, so I, I think there are two things. So last week, what we were saying, and, and we were wrong about this, hey, the, the rotation is not gonna happen because it's not fundamentally driven. The fundamentals just aren't there, right? Because what we're seeing is, if you look at surprise indices, they're rolling over, right? If you look at, at the reaction to bad news, companies are reacting poorly to bad news. But then you had, had the weekend and all of a sudden the political environment just changed, right? And this week it was all about, or almost all about um, the political. So I think the only thing that's really long tailed in nature are things that touch that, that regulatory environment. 
as far as the fundamentals, we need to start digesting the fundamentals. And I still think the, the fundamentals favor your larger cap and your growth of your names. We'll, we'll see, right? Yeah. But until we see the fundamentals change, I'm still not entirely sure that you're going to see the broadening out that a lot of people hope. So let's park the banks, the yeah. regulatory story that you've yeah. got confidence on. I noticed in your research, and I think this is a fair characterization based on what you've just said as well, a little bit nervous about incoming earnings so far. Yeah. The likes of Delta, what we heard yeah. from United yesterday, Pepsi yep. as well. What are you seeing in those stories? It, it's not great, right? So the economy is not as strong as I think people expected. And, and what you're seeing is, you know, if you look at the beginning of the year, a lot of economists, I think the, the forecast was for like one or one, one, two, and it doubled. But economic strength did not double. And what happened was people took out the recession forecast, right? It wasn't, oh my God, the, the economy is so strong. It's, eh, we're not going to have a recession. Right. And now what we're looking at is, hey, we didn't expect the Fed to be as strong or, or, or as tight as they have been. And that that's starting to eat into in, into the psyche. What's also happening is you're having inflation fatigue and you're also seeing that companies have been pushing price and individuals are beginning to push back. Right. And, and so now you really can't have it. And what we say is the economy is not going to bail you out. People think the economy is accelerating. I just don't see it. And so we need things to slow down. And what we've had is we had a bump because of the, the Trump trade, but it's really not supported by the fundamentals. But there are people who say it's not the economy that's going to save us. It's right. the Fed that's going to save us. And we're going to get some Fed, right. Fed cuts rather. And that means that for these small caps right. that have floating rate debt, they're all going to be saved. Yeah, it, fair point, right? So we were oversold. We had an oversold bounce. Um, now, this is probably the oddest easing cycle we've ever, I've ever seen, right? Typically, when you enter an easing cycle, things are really bad. The Fed's cutting because either there's a liquidity issue or the economy's slowing down. Here, they're just saying, hey, we're going to start cutting. So how are they going to cut? 25 basis points here, 25 basis points there. Is that really aggressive enough to change the economy? I don't think so. Is that enough to change an oversold condition to something a little bit better? Yeah, I think so. But until you see the economy starting to reaccelerate, it's really hard for those smaller cap companies that have a tremendous amount of balance sheet and operational leverage to outperform for a sustained period of time. Mid-cap growth. You've heard some of the simplistic sort of commentary we've heard over the last couple of weeks as well, which is sort of buy everything else, leave big tech behind, buy everything else. Right. Can you tell us not just what you want to buy, banks, right. what wouldn't you touch? What would you tell our audience this morning as everyone gets wrapped mm. up in the everything else rally? Yeah. What should they avoid? Yeah, so we're, we're still not fans of commodity and commodity-related stocks. If you're going to a period where inflation's lower, I'm not really sure how that works. Also, if we don't think the economy is accelerating, those are places where, where we don't want to be. So we're still underweight um, energy, and, and we think that's going to be a, a difficult spot. So anything commodity, commodity-related, you know, in an inflation or a non-inflationary environment, I just don't see how it works. Chris, it's good to see you. Upgrade good in the banks. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chris Harvey there of Wells Fargo on the latest, the Trump trade and the distinction between the Trump trade and just a traditional rotation. Equities right now on the S&P 500, firmer by a tenth of 1%. And let's get you an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg brief. Here's your Hira Hackers. Hi, John. The Democratic revolt against President Joe Biden is growing. Congressman Adam Schiff saying publicly that he has serious concerns about Biden's ability to beat Donald Trump in November. This coming as ABC News reports that top congressional Democrats Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries told the president last week it would be best if he ended his re-election bid. And CNN reporting that former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told Biden that polling shows he can't win. And staying on Biden, the president has tested positive for COVID-19. The White House saying he's experiencing mild symptoms and is planning to carry out his full duties while self-isolating in Delaware. His diagnosis coming at a critical time on the campaign trail. Biden canceling an appearance before a key Latino advocacy group as the Democratic revolt against his candidacy, candidacy picks up steam. And Ford is planning to invest $3 billion to build its highly profitable Super Duty F-Series pickup truck at a plant in Canada that was previously earmarked to make EVs. The automaker will open the plant in 2026, employing 1,800 workers. The move underscores that the changing market for vehicles, with the company adapting to slowing growth in EV demand, while its consumers prefer more of its large trucks. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahara, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, an ECB rate decision. We'll catch up with Lizzie Burden in Frankfurt, Germany, and get the thoughts of Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon. That's all up next from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
We are seconds away from an ECB rate decision. Last time around, they reduced interest rates. This time around, we're looking for rates to stay unchanged at the European Central Bank. And that is how they stay, unchanged at the ECB. Three interest rates to go through, all three going absolutely nowhere. The main refinancing rate of 425, we're looking at 450 on the marginal lending facility, 375 on the deposit rate. The ECB not doing much off the back of this at 109.30. Lots of headlines as always to work through. Danny, what do you see? I mean, you could argue these are the same. We need to wait for longer type of headlines. They're going to follow data dependent meeting by meeting approach. They're determined to get inflation back down to 2% in a timely manner. Basically, incoming information broadly supports inflation assessment. That is that they need to hold and they're not ready yet. This is a very different language from the ECB last time around that very well telegraphed a cut. This is more language saying we don't know what we're doing yet. We're not ready. We still need to get back down to 2%. We are not pre-committing to a particular rate path. I imagine we'll hear the same thing from the Federal Reserve in the next couple of months as well. On the ground in Frankfurt, Germany, at ECB HQ is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, we're expecting no change. And Lizzie, that's what we got. Yeah, it's summer vibes in Frankfurt, John. You know the Europeans like a long summer holiday, not to rub it into the two of you, but the this is exactly what was expected. You had all of the economists in our survey saying that there'd be no change today because in September, of course, they'll have two more CPI prints, more wage and productivity data. They'll know what the Fed's doing and they'll know how the French politics is going to shake out. So you're right, Danny, to identify that this is a cautious ECB. They learn their lesson after June, that June cut well telegraphed, perhaps over telegraphed, they box themselves into a corner. Uh, so even if we are expecting a September cut, they do not want to uh, over commit to it yet. And I expect that's the tone that Christine Lagarde is going to take in the press conference later as well, half an hour until that. Lizzie, just a nod maybe to what's been developing in France over the last month. And it's a subtle one at that. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I'd like your thoughts on it. TPI. You know what TPI is, the Transmission Protection Instrument. TPI is available to counter unwarranted and disorderly dynamics. What do you think that could be about? Well, look... Christine Lagarde is going to get asked about France in this press conference. It's her homeland. But a lot of the questions about the disruption in the bond market from the French election is kind of a last week's story, right? And we saw in the bond auction this morning that actually there was good demand in France. So it looks as if there isn't going to be a huge uh, ruckus for the ECB to have to deal with. But it is, whatever Christine Lagarde says, going to be interesting on how the ECB views its role when it comes to financial stability, to your point. Lizzie, just another headline to bring to you. They're saying the headline inflation to remain well above target into 2025. We heard the same thing last, money, uh, last meeting with their update of their inflation projections. But of course, it was an awkward one because they did that and cut. How much of what we're about to hear from Madame Lagarde is her trying to get out of that box, out of that corner that they put themselves into in the last meeting. Well, we have actually a really great story on the terminal about the uh, question marks around these forecasts because of the heavy reliance on productivity to make them come true. Uh, so, you know, inflation in the eurozone is sticky, stickier than in the UK. I would draw that comparison. The Bank of England has inflation back at target and still there are question marks over whether it's going to cut in August. So very much so, Christy Lagarde is not going to want to box herself in for that September cut. But the market does expect that we'll have two more cuts this year. And so far, policymakers, even at the hawkish end of the spectrum here in Frankfurt, have actually been leaning towards backing those market expectations. Lizzie, great work as always. Lizzie Burden at the headquarters of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Germany, on the latest ECB rate decision, unchanged as expected. I should be super clear, just for clarity, that line on the transmission protection instrument, also in the June statement. But you just get a feeling that line takes on additional importance after the political developments over in France over the last month. And there are a lot of people, Robin Brooks over at the IAF was one of them, basically said that they will step in to save France should they need to. And this creates this political weirdness where they are stepping in and allowing a government to run big deficits like they did with Italy when they initially used it. But the language we've heard from Madame Lagarde and the rest of the ECB has been one of, look, we're only stepping in if the moves are unwarranted. You have to assume that 
should deficits widen and there be issues with bond spreads that they'd be warranted. Let's turn to Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon, who's been monitoring these decisions at the ECB for a long, long time. And I've been doing it with him also for a long time. Jeff, it's good to see you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Let's talk about this statement from the European Central Bank. Can we start super narrow and then we'll get super broad? I want to start with France. And of course, TPI has been in the statement for a while. But I think you're going to get questions about that in the news conference today. Jeff, do you think we can park the French issue? Is it over? Is it in the rearview mirror? No, I don't think we can park the French issue, um, but I don't think it's the risk uh, that the TPI is looking at right now. Uh, as uh, you yourselves have been reporting, uh, it's the upside risks to inflation coming from a strong fiscal boost in France and possibly in Germany, given the latest settlement relative to baseline. So if you go to Lagarde's Sintra speech last year, not this year, she highlighted how public sector wages and the lack of productivity in the public sector, that was a contributory factor to inflation. She she didn't mention it this time around, I think due to the timing. Uh, but overall, I think that's the short term risk to ECB policy, to ECB monetary policy execution. So it's not about market volatility or anything like that. That I totally agree with. But it's what if this causes the ECB to be higher for longer than they previously expected as well. So, Jeff, let's get into it. There was some criticism of the last decision when they reduced interest rates. Sok Jen were with us a little bit earlier this morning. You've heard this phrase before that that decision was data independent, not data dependent. It was data independent. What's your base case now for when or if this ECB cuts again? Uh, well, I still think September is absolutely a live meeting. Uh, so, uh, you know, given where the Fed is heading, uh, we uh, believe that the Fed probably is on course for September as well. Uh, that opens up policy space, you know, not just for the ECB, but globally. So they can actually uh, continue at least, you know, one a quarter. That is basically, you know, what all G10 central banks are looking at right now, with one or two exceptions. It's not about backward-looking data where they are. It is about forward-looking data. Are they on path to see inflation head back to target? And the answer for now is still yes. I still worry about the manufacturing sector. They can't really divert any attention to that at this point. Uh, but I'll admit my euro dollar core right now, it's not looking uh, that healthy, you know, given the uh, direction of travel for policy divergence. You want to change that live on air mm. with us, Jeff, your euro dollar call? Uh, <laughs> Still, still heading in the same direction, absolutely euro dollar lower. Parity is absolutely looking uh, quite aggressive right now, but through 105, heading towards the end of the year, especially given where the, uh, the risks of to US yields are uh, heading into the election, you know, I'm still very clear on the direction of travel. So you said you were worried about manufacturing, but the, side in the, thor the thorn in the side of the ECB has been services. And their wage growth, if you look at the latest Indeed wage tracker, something like 4 0.2%. You look at that, you look at all the people traveling over to Europe, Jeff, what gives you confidence that that side of the picture plays along and allows the ECB to cut? Yeah. I totally agree. Now, that side of it doesn't give me too much confidence, you know, for them. But assuming that they only narrowly focus on it, and this is when one of the criticisms uh, that uh, President Macron uh, did levy at the ECB, uh, sort of uh, implicitly saying maybe the ECB should look at a broader mandate, you know, maybe a dual mandate, which is still quite restrictive, you know, from their point of view. So I'm not saying that's going to register any changes um, in the near future. But the risk is uh, that you allow those issues to fester indefinitely. And then when it really is, time, let's say services inflation due to base effects or otherwise start to come down and you finally start to be uh, able to, uh, to uh, redirect some attention to that sector, it's already too late, especially given potential trade barriers coming through as well. Jeff, you gave a nod, just touched on what was developing on this side of the Atlantic. Can we finish the conversation there, Jeff? I had a guest on the programme earlier this morning, Jay Pulaski of TPW. Jay made the point that he thinks the platform, the campaign effort, the policies that might come through next year from the Trump administration, if he gets a second term, would actually damage the US dollar. Are you taking a different perspective on what we might see? We need to look at time horizon at this point, irrespective of the candidates. We are looking at two things. A, tariffs. I think that is a consensus in the US right now. B, strong fiscal or at least no fiscal restraint. That's not just a consensus in the US. It's a consensus in everywhere in G10 apart from uh, New Zealand. So those two aspects, as long as it's a stable trajectory, the dollar wouldn't be damaged. But at, one po at some point, if international investors, they start to wonder about debt sustainability, then it's a different issue. But for now, looking at our flows, looking at the strong buying of duration by cross-border investors into the US. That doesn't seem to be an issue yet, but we'll see. Jeff Yu of BMY. A lot to talk about, Jeff. It's good to catch up, sir, as always. Two very different views there.
on foreign exchange, Danny. I gotta say, more people do sound like Jeff than they do with Jay. His is definitely an out of consensus view. And part of it is this idea of the Fed's cutting cycle that they are broadcasting, they're able to cut, and that allows everybody else to. That, as Jeff was saying, gives the ECB room to cut. It gives Mexico, Brazil, yep. all of them room to cut. So sure, even if things look bad in the US, they're gonna look worse elsewhere, keeping that dollar strength alive. You know what these summer ECB decisions are like. You know how these news conferences go. It always feels like they just wanna get away for vacation. I think we do have to sort of dwell on the last decision though. Sog Gem were pretty punchy about it, others too. They called it data independent. It didn't make sense to cut then. Others think it doesn't make sense to cut now. Will it in a couple of months time? I mean, all of, about, all of it is awkward. You had inflation and wage figures coming in hotter before they cut, and then their own projections were also higher, which they are again this time. They still see inflation running too hot in 2025. What is it going to look like when you're cutting and you're saying, actually, inflation is going to remain above our target? Programming note for you, the ECB News Conference with Christine Lagarde, the ECB president. That begins at about 20 minutes time. We'll take that here on Bloomberg Television. Before we get there, we need to break down jobless claims for you. Jobless claims on the other side at 8.30 Eastern time, just after this commercial break. When we get those numbers, we'll break them down for you. And then we'll catch up with Rob Sokin of City alongside Alberto Gallo of Andromeda Capital Management from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Jobless claims in just a moment. Seconds away, we're looking for 229,000. That is the median estimate in our survey. The previous week, 222. That's 15 seconds out. Here's the price action, the scores going into it. Equity futures firmer by two tenths on the S&P, bouncing back on the Nasdaq by a half of 1%. The Russell down by about a third. If you get to the bond market, I'll show you the two year just quickly. Your yield there is 4, 45, 45. Yields higher by a basis point or two. With the economic data, let's cross over to Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. We get an unexpected pop in jobless claims that it might worry people in the markets and think that it gives the Fed a little more incentive to cut rates going forward. 243,000, and as you just said, 229 was the expectation. Continuing claims also jumped a little bit, uh, 1,867,000 from 1,847,000. Last week's initial claims revised to 223. Now, here's the in interesting part of it. It is jobless claims for uh, this week's number is based on last week's filings, which was the week, the reference week for the July payrolls report. So this might suggest that we might see a little weakness in the payrolls report, and that would get people interested on Wall Street. We also got Philadelphia Fed. They come in a much higher than anticipated. The forecast was for 2.9. Instead, it's 13 point nine uh, prices received at uh, 24.2 from uh 13.7 and the new orders index at 20.7 versus negative 2.2 prices paid the other uh important one 19.8 versus 22.5 so we've seen some negative employment news but some positive price news this morning and that is going to add up to people thinking the fed is going to cut soon mike i think it's really important before we progress this conversation to reflect on what we saw this time last week. CPI came in beneath expectations. This market ripped. Together with that, we got jobless claims that also dropped too. And I think that restored some confidence about the strength in the labor market. With this number here this morning, Mike, and it's just one data point granted, but do you think the jury's still out on the strength of the labor market? Is that something the Federal Reserve needs to think about just that little bit more at this month's meeting? Well, I think both is the answer to that. The Fed's going to have to think about it a little bit more because they are expecting a little more weakness in the labor market. But it's also July, and a lot of auto plants and others uh, shut down for retooling, and you get some pops in jobless claims during July. I know everybody hates the word seasonal adjustment, but it uh, comes into play here. So we'll have to see if we get a couple of weeks of this kind of performance uh, with people uh, filing for new claims. Uh, we're not at a point yet where it looks like the labor market's about to collapse, but it does look like things are getting a little bit weaker. Well, to that point, Mike, Waller was speaking yesterday and said that there are more risks to unemployment than he's seen in a long time. What, what difference of tone is that from Waller? What difference does it make to you that he's starting to speak about the labor market in that way? Well, what he's saying is that the risks are more balanced now. And the, the way things had set up for the past year, 
companies couldn't find workers and they were uh, desperately looking for them and paying more to get them. Now the risk is that if there is an economic slowdown, and uh, we didn't see it in the Philly Fed numbers too much today, but if it were to uh, slow, then companies might be more willing to uh, cut workers, but at the same time, they'd be less willing to hire workers, even if they're not letting them go. So we see a drop in the hiring uh, in the July payrolls report or the August payrolls report. Uh, but I have to also point out Tom Barkin, the Richmond Fed president yesterday, said he thinks the labor market is still very strong. Strong. Matt McKee, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. An update there on the labour market. Let's talk about whether this market is very strong. Continuing claims, climbing just a little bit. Initial jobless claims, 243. The estimate was 229. The previous number, a revised 223. To weigh in on things, joining us now is Rob Sarkin of City, alongside Alberto Gallo of Andromeda Capital Management. Rob, I want to come to you first because you've got a big call over a city. You're looking for a recession in the United States of America and you're looking for that US recession this year. Where does it come from? And do these labor market data points of the last few weeks speak to it? Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, our U.S. team uh, is still looking for a recession in the second half of this year. There are really a number of factors you can point to uh, that to them suggest that the economy is going to slow down more sharply, uh, tightening credit conditions, strains, mm -hmm. lower income households, and a broad range of uh, softer labor market data um, as we're potentially seeing uh, this morning. Now, I want to also highlight that that call is very finely balanced, um, and there are a lot of strong arguments that suggest that the economy um, holds up better. Uh, the labor market's a perfect example. A lot of labor market indicators have moderated significantly, um, but historically, they're still at fairly healthy levels. I think you see that also with the jobless claims data uh, today. Now, the labor market can turn very quickly, which is why I think Fed officials have to be cautious as they watch these data. Um, but there's no doubt that the labor market has moderated. And then the debate is, is it moderating into a soft landing or is it moderating into some type of sharper slowdown? Alberto, can I just bring you into this? Because Rob speaks to something that you can take different ideas from different data points. and You have to look at the totality of it. So I want to get your take on his call and what the data is telling you at this moment. Good morning. So we're definitely in a soft patch for the U.S. economy, but that soft patch has been concentrated in the lower income part of the consumer, which is the part that's hit by high interest rates. So essentially people that have credit cards or auto loans and short term financing. But if we look at the rest of the economy, funding rates are still locked at very low levels from pre-COVID pretty much the era of low interest rates, which, which lasted 15 years. So we still continue to see very loose financing conditions. And you know we see this as a bump in the road where essentially the Fed needs to uh, make one or two insurance cuts. But we see the path for 2025 interest rates cuts that the market is extrapolating right now, essentially consistent with a recessionary outcome. At the same time, we have potentially Trump economics uh, you know, times two coming in. And um, the risk is that central bankers might extrapolate this weakness, while at the same time you have um, an additional, you know, spending and fiscal stimulus coming in next year. And I think that's why they're reluctant to give forward guidance. They got it wrong on inflation. It wasn't transitory. Now they're afraid of, um, you know, of, of um, leaning dovish, while at the same time, we might ent be entering a fiscal dominance period where monetary policy is not as relevant. It's no longer the only game in town. So we've got to look at the, at the forward fiscal stimulus that we, uh, that we have. And we cannot have Russell you know, breaking highs at the same time and you know, a lot of cuts being priced. One of the two has to give. Alberto, fiscal dominance, as you know, is a very technical term. Ultimately, for monetary policy, it means deviating from monetary policy objectives and focusing on the solvency of the government. Are you saying it's that? Or are we moving towards just an era where for markets the most important factor is fiscal and no longer monetary? Which one is it? It's, I think it's both, John. I think for markets, we got to look more at fiscal, at deficit and stimulus. And equity markets are just waking up to this. Bond markets are still asleep. And then eventually there is, in some countries, there will be a limit to, to how much fiscal policy can be deployed. There's one word, one word that you never hear from policymakers right now. And that's austerity. We've never heard about it since COVID. Fiscal policy has become pro-cyclical. 
So as a bond investor, uh, you know, I do care about what the central bank will do in September. You know, we know that the ECB and the Fed are going to cut, but I, I'm also thinking a lot about 2025 and that, you know, that rate cut path that markets are extrapolating looks exaggerated. And in that light, I also think that credit spreads are a little too tight here with companies that might struggle with higher for longer if, you know, if growth stays a trend. Of course, there's always a recession probability, but I think that, you know, uh, potentially we, we see very high odds of President Trump uh, winning again. That was also the case in June uh, before the recent events. And, you know, with that um, happening, you're going to have a lot more pro-cyclical, pro-inflation fiscal policy and trade policy in the U.S. Rob, I, I want to take what Alberto is talking about and marrying it to your call of history would tell us a recession is coming. What, what happens then if a recession comes and the deficit is already at huge levels, that we're already running a recession-like deficit in the good times? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And as you noted, uh, if you do look at history, that would argue that a recession is likely uh, in this environment. Whenever wage growth, inflation got as high as they did and labor markets got as tight as they did, you typically had a recession. But as noted, a lot of things have been different in this cycle, and I think the risks there um, are, are pretty balanced. Um, now, in terms of fiscal policy, I think that's an also a great question. Is, is, as we've been discussing, we've been running um, high deficits during uh, expansionary times. Um, and I think that is the lay of the land going forward, regardless of the cyclical condition of the economy. Now, maybe if you get into a recession, you'll see some more type of recessionary spending, depending on how uh, deep it is to 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 cushion that blow. But I think even if the economy stays resilient, uh, we're in a ri large deficit rising debt world, whether it's a Trump presidency, a Biden presidency or a different Democrat. Um, it's uh, it's it's likely going to happen until markets tell the U.S. government that they're not willing to absorb the debt. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office's baseline, you're looking at five and a half percent of GDP deficits for the next decade. That compares to three and a half percent pre-COVID, and that's based on current law. Um, and I think there are a lot of risks to deficits to the upside under both types of administrations. So I really think, you know, it, regardless if they were in a recession or a, a resilient economy, uh, I think you're looking at large deficits for the foreseeable future. Rob, couldn't I say that resilient economy is a feature of the large deficits? All those economists who thought we were going to go into recession this year, when they backtracked on their call, they did so by saying it's because the Biden administration spe spent so much that the, R the IRA came in and it basically saved this economy. Is there not sort of a factor of maybe this economy stays afloat because of the deficits, because of the spending? I think uh, the fiscal um, situation certainly has supported the economy throughout this cycle. And you've seen that specifically in certain types of data. You know, you've seen, for example, uh, manufacturing related construction has risen fairly rapidly in recent years uh, following the passage of uh, the IRA. Uh, but that being said, I don't think it's predominantly fiscal that's been supporting the economy. When you look at major developed markets and you compare uh, the growth in deficits uh, in this cycle relative to where they were running pre-COVID, kind of a measure of the fiscal support to the economy, um, the U.S. does not stand out that drastically um, from uh, most other developed markets, including those in Europe, where growth has been much weaker. So I think the fiscal has helped, but I really think there's something else going on within the U.S. that supported the economy, uh, resilient demand for services, very strong consumer balance sheets, um, and uh, willingness to draw down pandemic savings that consumers built up during, uh, during that period. So I think fiscal's helped. But it's not been the be all end all story for for the U.S. Hey, Rob, we've got to leave it there. Rob Sockin of City, Alberto, we've got to do this again soon. We've got a lot to talk about. Alberto Gallo there of Andromeda Capital Management. Jobless claims coming in a little bit higher than expected with an update on stories elsewhere. With your Bloomberg brief, here's Jahara Hackers. Hi, John. An upside surprise on those jobless claims data. Initial claims for the past week came in at 243,000. The estimate was for 229,000, while continuing claims were the highest since November 2021. 
claims data is prone to big weekly swings at this time of the year, but a weaker labor market could fuel the case for Fed rate cuts, with markets currently pricing in the first cut in September. The ECB kept rates on hold and offered no indication that it will move in September. Investors will now turn to President Christine Lagarde's news conference for clues on the central bank's path forward. The ECB's statement saying it's not pre-committing to a particular rate path and, quote, domestic price pressures are still high, services inflation is elevated, and headline inflation is likely to remain above the target well into next year. And the Financial Times is reporting that Meta has explored a multi-billion euro investment in eyewear group Essilor Luxottica, which is the company behind Ray-Ban sunglasses. It's the latest move from the Facebook owner to intensify its push to develop smart glasses. The first Ray-Ban Meta glasses were launched in 2021, but the newest generation launched back in October sold and sold more in a few months than the previous version did in two years, leading Meta to hold talks to deepen the collaboration. Collaboration. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahara, thank you. Thanks for this morning. Up next on the programme, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde's news conference in Frankfurt, Germany. From New York, this is Bloomberg. News conference in Frankfurt, Germany, just getting underway over at the ECB. Just watching that out the corner of my eye. We'll turn to that in just a moment. Let's get to the trading diary. This is what things look like today. Fed speak continues. We'll get Goolsby, Logan, Daly and Bowman. We'll get Netflix earnings coming up a little bit later after the closing bell. Tonight, Donald Trump formally accepting the GOP nomination and delivering a speech rewritten, of course, after Saturday's assassination attempt. Then tomorrow, more Fed speak from Williams and Bostick. A little bit earlier this morning, the ECB saying domestic price pressures are still high, services inflation is still elevated and headline inflation is likely to remain above the target well into next year. They did not make a move on interest rates at this meeting. They did at the last one when they reduced interest rates. The focus, rather like the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell, is on September. At the July meeting, here's the ECB President, Christine Lagarde. To all of you.